uh, capture the QR code, or you may also want to jot this down. So this PDF will be available for quite a while. Uh, yes, uh, it's not PDF, it's a Google Docs. Oh, Google Docs. Yeah, it's a Google Docs. Um, it will be available for a while, but most likely after this session, we will revoke the access. Um, and then it should be accessible through the phone. Um, we're not printing it because if we print it, it will be as this thick and we don't want to waste paper. So, so we're yeah. only wasting paper for ourselves. Yes. Just to make sure that we remember. Recycled paper. <laughs> yes. So just give, give everyone a bit of time to capture this. Yeah. Any issues on the handout? Nope? Okay. okay. I still see some phones up so If the QR code doesn't work, maybe you can try the link. Yeah. We, we do have like feedback from some friends whom we tested this workshop on. That yeah. QR code sometimes doesn't work. We don't know why it works on our phones. So yeah. You might want to like just copy down the URL as well. Okay, I think we can move on. Moving on, starting with a very brief introduction to UX research. Yep. So um, we'll talk a bit about user experience. Um, user experience is experience. It's not design. It's not visuals. Um, I will show you the easiest way, um, uh, the easiest example of user experience that most of you guys would have experienced. <coughs> so we we'll start with the onboarding of Singapore. Um, you would go to Singapore, you would arrive in the airport, which uh, most likely you would reach the conveyor belt um, after your luggage um, be in the conveyor belt. So usually um, the conveyor belt will give you the luggage faster than you reach the conveyor belt, which is a very good experience in the airport. Um, and then next, the next thing you can do as the first time we're going to Singapore is that you can go to the coolest mall probably currently which they have a fountain and then forest inside the mall as well which is just few steps away from the airport and then once you've done with your first experience in um in jewel you can go to the city which the mrt is just downstairs from the airport <coughs> and then you would go to the cab and then you would take the ER, uh, ecp and then through the ecp you will see the kalang river on the right and then you will see MBS on the left, which is the million dollar view. So user experience is more like experience rather than just design. It is something that humans are experiencing. And in SP Digital, we always start with the people um, we were designing for, and then we end with a solution that, they're, that uh, meets their needs and pain points. We probably have two guiding principles in SP Digital, which is first one is consumer centered. Everything that we do, we always start with the users. Um, it doesn't come from um, whoever from the senior level tell us what to do. It's, it's, everything comes from the user and more of the user problem. The next one is data driven. Everything that we do, we tr always try to measure uh, based on data. So research is not always about qualitative, but it's also about quantitative, which I'm going to dip deeper um, on the last section as well later on. In SP Digital, we use Lean which um, we start with learn. Um, be actually, before learn, sometimes we will gather some ideas as well um, using design workshop. And then after design workshop, we will test the designs using um, testing with our users. And then we will build the product. Once we build the product, we will use GA uh, to measure the features of the performance. So we, because we believe that by measuring it with numbers and quantitative is the easiest way to measure our success. So we talked a little bit about user experience uh, process. That was really a very brief introduction. We talked a very little bit about user experience and all. Um, so now let's move on to talking about research. So um, the research term itself, in startup development, is actually quite broad. So over here, we mapped it out to uh, market research, from market research all the way to user um, research. So if you think about it, on one end, there is market research, which deals with market sizes, trends, regulations. These are all the numbers. Uh, that need to be sorted out. And then on what we are concerned with today, for today's workshop, is more of the user side. When we do with, deal with like specific user needs, workflows, pain points, usability benchmarking, all this kind of stuff. So when you talk about research itself, research is a very, very broad term that covers all of this. Um, and we map it out on the spectrum from the macro to the micro level, uh, also because we want to express the idea that when it comes to research, 
market research and, and user research has to come hand in hand. It's not as if like, oh, the market research people just do that and that's it. Really, um, the user research people just focus usability, benchmarking, and that's it. But you actually have to collaborate uh, pretty closely together and we find that when people work together, when this two, when people on this two ends of spectrum work closely together, you get a lot of cross-pollination of insights. So why do we define uh, user research is? User research specifically is about understanding user behaviors, needs, and motivations so that we may be able to build the, the right thing right. Um, I stole this from somewhere, so I forgot the source, but I wrote this down. So please do not <laughs> attribute the whole quote to me. So I just wanted to make it clear. So for today's, uh, for today's workshop, we're focused uh, very much on user research. And when it comes to user research, there are two main kinds. There are qualitative uh, user research and there's quantitative uh, user research. So on the qualitative side, what are we dealing with? Again, we're dealing with um, a lot of observational kind of insight. It depends very much on the interpretation of the designer or the researcher or the PM or whoever is conducting the research to interpret the data that is being uh, found through the research. On the quantitative side, we're dealing with why, um, how much, uh, what exactly is happening. We're dealing with a lot of measurement. Uh, and for SP Digital, because we use the lean process, uh, we do, uh, we basically have this, uh, we basically have this measurement cycle towards the end. We, we try to define what, what it is that we want to measure towards the end of every two week cycle and then we measure to see whether or not we're on the right track. So um, for today's workshop, we're focusing very much on qualitative uh, user research, especially on the interviews itself. But we will touch on a little bit about uh, quantitative research, especially in the last section. So that's it for a very, very quick introduction. Now we'll get to the more fun stuff. Okay. So when we talk about user interview, um, user interview is basically a one-on-one -on -one, um, session with our users in a more intimate setting, um, giving questions, behavioral questions to understand their needs, their pain points, and their expectation. Um, so I will show you, like, I will show you a week of our research. Um, typically, we w I want to show this. The reason I want to show this is because. When you're probably trying to Google like research process or like day one to day five, usually they go very high level. So I'm just trying to say that that is always, not always the case when you do research. I will show you some few things that we do every when we do research in a week and it's not always very tidy. Uh, sometimes it's very messy. So we will start probably on um, not first day, maybe day zero um, Thursday. Um, on the Thursday, probably like we will talk to, we will identify the product, and then we will identify the topic and targeted participants. Um, we will start crafting a research plan, and then we will make sure whatever our understanding is aligned with the POs and under uh, other stakeholders as well. And then the next day, most likely there will be a design workshop or design sprint. It doesn't have to be through design workshop. It doesn't have to be through design sprint. But typically, we do a lot of design workshop because we have so many stakeholders. So when we do design workshop, we always try to do um, our work before our workshop so that um, after the workshop, we can just execute everything. But we always try to make sure that, that on the day when we do workshop, we um, almost at least almost finish the planning so that we can execute on the next day and then we will have a design workshop we will blast the recruitment form as well based on the targeted users that have been aligned and then the next day we will have the designers prototype the designs uh, for testing based on that is produced from the design workshop and then us researchers so we will schedule the participants based on the um, submissions from the type form so uh, the, the reason we, we blast the type recruitment form typically on Friday because so that we have um, two weeks and eh, not two weeks, two days on the weekends to get some submission um, from our user pool. On yes, on Tuesday, um, we will start the interview. Um, and then when we do interview, typically we will interview seven to nine users. Um, so typically in one day, we will interview, interview four to five users. Um, a bit tiring, but I think it's doable. Um, and then like while we do the interview, we'll try to clean up the findings as well um, on the go while doing the interview. And then the next day on Wednesday, we will do the next round of it, next day of the interview. Um, so probably if we do four, then we will do three um, on the Wednesday and then we will do clean up findings as well at the same day. And then on Thursday, we will um, clean up the findings. We will synthesize and analyze the insights, craft the research report as well at the same time. So we will do a Friday on presentation on the report 
and then um, not forgetting blast thank you email to the users. So it has always been never, it never really structured, it's quite, always quite messy. Um, and then also I would say that I, I wouldn't do this alone, and sometimes I would do it alone, but a lot of the times right now I have Shein or I have another colleague of mine who is amazing in doing research ops, but she can't be here unfortunately. But um, basically this is how we do um, and then we always try to get feedback or findings to be um, reported to the stakeholders by a week um, so we make sure that the delivery is on time as well um, and then yeah so uh, I don't know about y'all but when I first joined the company and I saw that there was the standard schedule I was a little freaked out because I've never done so many interviews and two days before um, so, just kudos to nothing about setting it up. So, um, back, uh, yes, question. Oh, well, what do you mean by cleanup finding? We will run you through on the next session. Yeah. yeah. So, oh, uh, before I forget, uh, one thing that we want to try out with this workshop is that uh, we noticed that, okay, I am personally a very introverted and quiet person by nature and nurture. So, if you have any questions as well um, and you don't want to like interrupt people, you can also write it down on a post it note and pass it to any of the facilitators. Facilitators, can you raise your hands? Yeah. Yep, you can uh, give it to the facilitators over here. You can, you can pass it to the facilitators and they'll pass it to us. So, we'll try to answer all of the questions towards the end of the sessions as well. Or if not, you can like try to find us towards the end of the session. We just want to try this out so that everybody can ask questions. Even you're a little shy and like Yeah, okay, anyway, jumping back to the schedule, we'll talk about the cleanup of the finding paper. So jumping back um, to, the, to the research topic, earlier on, Naning mentioned in, on the Thursday before that she would decide on a research topic. So how exactly do you decide on a research topic? Now, for this, I actually think you can write an entire article or run an entire workshop about it by itself, but because we don't have the time, I'm just gonna breeze through it really, really quickly. So for me, personally, I think that actually deciding on a research topic is an art and science by itself. It's really difficult. If you ask me what I want for lunch, I don't even know what I want for lunch. So how do I figure out what the hell is it that I don't know and I want to figure out? But really, finding out a research topic boils down to one simple question. What do I want to know? And, oh, that's yeah. a fault with the animation. Don't mind that. You get a preview first. <laughs> so, Finding on a research topic can start from a lot of different places. I tried to Google this online to do my own little homework to figure out like how people were deciding on a research topic, um, but I couldn't find like any good resources or that says like definitively this is the framework which will land you on the perfect research topic. So through our own experiences, we found that um, figuring out what to even begin researching on may come from number one. A hypothesis from the roadmap, for example. Let's say, oh, um, your company founder or like a, P a product manager or product owner comes to you and says, next quarter we are going to build this thing. And you're like, mm, I'm not too sure about it. That's prime for research. Or let's say uh, you know that your company vision is this thing and you know that we want to get here, um, but you're not too sure about how to get there. You don't have a clear roadmap. That's also prime for research. <coughs> So your research topic may also come from previous rounds of research. Maybe you've been speaking to a lot of people, but you're getting more questions than you're getting answers. Well, that's your follow-up research. Otherwise, yeah, otherwise, let's say, oh, maybe the, the team has done some blue sky explorations concepts and they want to test and validate it. That's prime for research. You can get a lot of people in, test them out, figure out whether or not um, the, the concepts actually work, whether they make sense. If you have an existing product, uh, that's been around for a while, people have been adding a lot of different stuff to it. Maybe the product has a certain age, you might want to do some benchmarking on it to figure out like, with all of these different teams working on it, uh, does it still make sense? Does this product actually still make sense? Uh, and then number five is, oh, you have an, again, you have an existing product, you have a support forum, or maybe you have a Twitter account and people are complaining about your stuff on the Twitter account, you want to investigate more, that's prime, that, that can be a research topic as well. Ah, that's the animation bug. <laughs> so after coming up with a research topic, then usually we figure out like, okay, how exactly do we go about finding out the method that we want? So from research topic to method, um, it actually usually starts with this. First off, you start off with what do I need to know? We, we need to first understand what is the question that we are asking ourselves, what is the question that we're trying to find the answers to? And then the next question to ask is, 
what data do I need to answer this question? Let's say we are re revamping our product, we want to uh, redefine the information architecture of this. What information do I need to be able to confidently uh, redesign the information architecture of this site? Oh, let's say I'm re I have a site navigation, I want to figure out like, what should come first. Do I need a rough sense of stack, like rank preferences, or do I need definite sense of rank preferences? This will tell you whether you should be going with maybe just like quick interviews, or maybe you should be going with like a, a more uh, a more robust cut sorting exercise. So you first first have to figure out like what exactly it is that you want to know, and then what data do I need to answer this question? Is it qualitative? Is it quantitative? Is it something that uh, we we don't need to be very confident about? Is it something that it's very difficult to find out? What is the cost of finding out this information as well? And then once you have that, then you, you need to figure out like, how do I get this data? So I need, I need rank preferences. Then how do I get rank preferences? Do I get uh, existing users? Do I just go onto the street and find random people to do a quick gorilla test? Do I blast this out um, to many, many people? Do I recruit people in and whatnot? So the, the method is determined by the research topic that you want to uh, do research on, not the other way around. Um, when you talk about the research, um, how to do the research, um, there's a lot of research methodologies. There's qualitative, there's quantitative. Inside qualitative itself, there's a lot more different methodologies from user interview, ethnography, diary studies, you name it. Um, for our team, we fo not focus, but we do a lot more user interviews compared to others because we want to focus to get feedback as fast as possible from the users before um, either before or after launching a product so that we can measure our success. So that's why we will focus a lot more on user interview because we believe that um, user interview probably not the best way to get um, the most results, but you will get the most results for it, the time um, that has taken. So when we do user interview, we will start with the planning for our team. And then these are the things that usually you would include in a user interview plan. Um, for those who's taking pictures, don't worry, we have it, everything on the, on the handout. So, um, and the details as well inside it, whatever I'm going to talk about, everything is a handout. Um, so usually we'll start with introduction and overview because the research plan, we will always distribute it to our stakeholders and our stakeholders will always start looking into the interview, whether it's a PO, designers, engineers, whatever, all the stakeholders will look into the research plan usually. When we do the research plan, uh, we, when, we see, when they see the research plan, not everyone will understand the context, why we are doing this interview, why we are doing this research plan. So, so typically when we do, when we put the introduction overview, we'll put like whether this comes from a uh, design sprint, design workshop, why we are building this, why we are doing this research. Um, we will continue with the objectives, which is like um, why you want to do this research and what is the expected outcome of this particular research. Um, we will go to the participants as well, and then this is more of the targeted users for this particular research. Maybe not so much on the uh, targeted users for the app, but it could be a subset of, of the targeted users of the app, uh, more specific ones. But um, targeted participants should, should be something that is aligned very well with the PO and your stakeholders as well. Um, we will go with the timeline, which usually would include of um, the timeline of the research, like when is the expected research report, for example. And then what is the schedule of the sessions, user interview sessions in case the stakeholders wanna um, join or watch the session. Usually we would have like a Google Hangout um, and then like we will um, blast the, we will give, we will cast the interview and then everyone in the company can watch the interview as well. And then we will start with the questions, which is usually we'll start with discovery questions, um, which goes back into the user's, user's previous experience. Um, and then we will go in with the design questions which um, intended to evaluate the designs. Um, and then usually it's the next steps, which we usually will include like what is the measurement plan? So like for example, when we launch this product and then what? Um, are we going to include it on um, GA? What is the tracking plan for the GA? What will be included for um, the measurement plan? But whatever we put over here, um, I think you can include it whatever makes sense for you. As in like you don't have to include everything. Um, in my previous company, I don't include everything as well because it's a smaller company. But because like, this is a bigger company and then there's a lot of stakeholders, there's a lot of stakeholders that is not even inside SP Digital. It could be outside SP Digital. Um, so that's why we always try to make it very comprehensive so that people without even context can understand our research. So now that nothing has gone through the research plan, 
uh, let's talk about a little bit about recruitment. <laughs> Um, I had this interesting conversation. We had this interesting conversation uh, early on before this workshop with one of the uh, one of the volunteers about recruitment. So I just want to do a quick poll. Um, how how many of you have done recruitment before for your research? Okay, how many of you have no issues whatsoever doing recruitment? It's a <laughs> I need to learn from you. Yeah. Please teach me. Okay. Um, so recruitment, we obviously can't do qualitative user research, with, which is about observing users without actual users. So recruitment is a big part of qualitative user research, especially for interviews. So it's still a challenge for us uh, doing recruitment. Uh, it's slightly different between Nanning and myself. So we, d we deal with different business verticals. So for Nanning, I'm envious. Um, for me, it's a little, uh, let's not go there. But anyway, uh, we'll just talk a little bit about how we generally do recruitment and uh, go a little bit more into the context of like why I say she's a better time than you right now. So, oh, sorry for all the animation hiccups. <laughs> Let me just go back. Okay, I'm just going to show you everything. The number one, the number one thing that uh, we actually have in SD Digital is that on the consumer side, we actually have quite a big user pool, uh, which we often contact and reach out to, especially when we have research. So like what Nanning was saying, she blasts out the type, type form to the user pool um, a week before the actual research takes place. So we have around, I can't remember the numbers. I think it's about, yeah, now I think it's about 60 to 70 people and it's not a week. Usually sometimes we would do it on Friday and then by Monday we would have submissions already. Yeah, so, um, so what Nanning has done for the consumer business side is that we've actually built up a, a user pool where we can which we can easily tap on at any single point in time and say like, hey, we have some research, are you able to come, come down to our office at this particular point in time so that we can do a one hour interview with you um, and yes, you'll be paid for your time and what else is there. And so, yeah, we often, we also have all their uh, relevant characteristics, like for example, their age, um, their, uh, the area that they stay in, um, their, their, maybe their occupation as well and their tech savviness, etc. So that we can easily know like, okay, for this particular feature that we're researching on, who should be the people that we're targeting and how do we, how do we actually reach out to them. So we actually have a user pool that, and that speeds up recruitment a lot. So having a user pool speeds things up a lot, but there's also a risk in that uh, if all of your user pool have the same particular profile or background, you may get bias inside. So there's a, up, there's a pros and cons of that. How do we even get a user pool in the first place? <coughs> That's a different question. Um, we have more details in, in the handout as well, but an another method that we often rely on is to hire a recruitment agency. So one of the recruitment agencies, they are not paying us to see this, by the way. Uh, not endorsed. Not endorsed, yeah. it's Grace Army. So in my case, uh, I deal with B2B people. Like I sell, my business vertical has to do with business to business software. So um, especially, for example, um, I need to speak to building managers for example, like this building that we are in, someone is in charge of it. Someone is in charge of the utilities and making sure that everything is functional. <coughs> How do we recruit building managers? The profile of building managers generally, um, they are not very tech savvy. They don't trust you. They, most of the time, you approach them and they're like, why are you asking me all these questions? Get away from me. I don't want you to know all of this information. You will get me into trouble. So that's a profile that we are dealing with. And so it's really, really hard to recruit people. And the only way so far that's been more successful is to either rely on sales, either rely on uh, account executives, or rely on uh, external help like recruitment agencies, such as UX Army, which has been a huge relief for me actually. So the third way of getting uh, people for, for research would be support feedback request tickets. Early on, I said that, oh, you may have a lot of uh, fe feature requests coming in, in your forums or in your help center or your social media accounts. These people are your ideal research participants. Someone is complaining on your Twitter account, pounce on them, grab them. <laughs> they are ideal for recruitment. They, they, if they hate your product so much, but they're still on your product, speak to them. They're going to give you so much insight into why your product is not doing as well as it should. And the fourth method that we've also found successful is to go to events and locations where your target users will frequent. So let's say you're designing or you're, like you're researching on um, selling maybe to new parents. You would want to go to one of those expo convention events where they are selling products, baby products, and you might want to like just wait outside and just stop a random passerby who looks as if they are a new parent and ask like, hey, can I have 10 minutes of your time and you tell them more about like 
why you should join your research and what benefit they will get out of it. Or let's say you're trying to target like HR professionals, then you know, want to start stalking HR professional, HR conferences and HR professionals, and you want to go for like HR training <coughs> events. So right now, because I'm dealing with building managers, I've learned so much about managing a building in the past six months. Oh my goodness. <laughs> anyway, moving on. So yeah, moving on, you have the recruitment, then what about communication? Oh, sorry. Um, for us, I think, eh? Okay. Um, for us, I think um, we, again, I think the goal also, not, not the goal, but one of the things that we really looked at into when we do research is we try to make sure to deliver the insights as fast as possible. And we realized one of the things that takes the most of time is more on the research ops side of things rather than the interview, the conducting the research itself. So other than, for example, having the user pool, one of the things that we do as well is we templatize all of the emails that we have, which you can see in the handout on page 13. Um, one of th those are one of the things that we have on um, sending emails to our users. And typically what we have to include is that who we are, the topic of the interview session, when are we going to do it, and then um, detail time and date, what is it for the user, what's the value of the user, whether we're going to give cash, for example, how much is the cash, um, whether the session will be recorded or not. We even put the, some details on the, our email templates for, for stuff like our meeting room is extremely freezing, so you might want to make it, you, wanna, you might want to bring jacket because like, um, you'll get distracted because like, it, it is extremely freezing. Um, so yeah, we templatize everything as you can see over here. Um, on the page 13 is our template for our consumer, and then the page um, 14 is more on a template for a B2B um, email template. Go next. So, uh, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Um, the next thing that we do as well is that we also try to make sure that we cover the governance. Um, the governance as in like more on consent form. Having a proper governance or like having a proper consent form, um, it would assure that the participants understand what they are signing up for, um, that they understand that the details like whether this is recorded or not, whether um, what kind of things that they will talk about, um, and then your research and ethical and then complying with your regulation. For in Singapore is more on PDPA, which recently um, just I think like the, the the government is trying to do more to look more on PDPA, and then everyone in the um, space right now is doing migration from um, IC to login using email. But yeah, um, PDPA is something that you have to look at. Um, and then the on the consent form, typically what you need to um, cover. For example, first one is about yourself. Who are you? Whether you are a senior experience researcher, whether you are a designer, whether you are a product manager, and then who are you representing for? So whether for myself, like we are representing SP Digital. SP Digital is a subsidiary company under SP Group. The next one is the research itself. Um, the research is like the purpose of the research. What are we going to do of the research? Whether we are going to record the data, who owns the data? What are we going to do with the data? When we, when we present the data, who are, who are the people that we're going to share the data with? Um, and then about the participation itself, that the participation, everything is voluntary. They can stop or withdraw any time. And then the participant cannot talk anything that we talk about in the room because a lot of times when we do interview, we test the designs as well. When we test the designs, we test concepts that haven't launched yet as well. Um, so we have to make sure that the participants won't um, talk anywhere else outside the room. But all in all, um, I, as in like, even though I've told you, I've told you that these are the things that you need to include in your um, consent form, the first thing that you need to do is talk to your legal team, talk to your legal person. Um, legal is your best friend. Talk to uh, I. We we had a like two hour session talking to legal after me working in SP probably like one year, one and a half years, and then I realized the whole conversation is extremely enlightening um, because we realized like how to create consent form and then like what matters to legal and then like um, for example we can't really call to the user because the user in Singapore can put ourselves in non call registry. And then like we can get sued by the police. Um, so stuff like that is extremely important to be looked at. And, and so depending on like where your target interviewee is, you may have to deal with other compliance stuff, which is very fun, like GDP, GDPR, GDPA, California, a full term for it. Very fun. Um, anyway, so moving on, we in Asking Digital we also have a standard five interview. So 
It's kind of a framework that we follow. It's a framework, it's not a hard and fast rule that we must follow all the time. So uh, what this five factors rule does for us is basically provides a guideline, especially for maybe not, not so seasoned researchers, uh, to be able to conduct interviews on it by themselves as well. And it's for us to help communicate to the stakeholders what actually goes on in an interview. So what our five-fact interview consists of will be the first welcome, discovery, usability testing, concept testing, and debrief. Similar to a lot of things that we just shared, not everything needs to be included in every single interview. You may add on things, remove things, etc., etc. <coughs> so I'm just going to quickly go through what each and every single one of them um, is about. So number one, welcome. I don't know about you, but if some random stranger tells me to go down to their office and sit there for one hour and he or she is going to ask me a lot of questions for one hour, I'm going to feel super nervous. And I'm like, uh, no. I'm going to be like the building managers that I have to interview and I'm like, why are you asking me so much information about myself? So what a welcome does is that we welcome people into the office, we try to make them feel comfortable. Usually we provide food. We found that food is usually helpful in making people relax a bit. We put them in a comfortable but extremely cold room. We can't help with that. Um, and we try to establish like, okay, what is this session about? This is what's going to happen. We're trying to make them feel at ease. Yeah, nothing is going to go wrong. It's very safe. I think like about the, we try to make them comfortable to the point where we try to make the room more like a therapy room. Yeah. So we put like um, couch chairs and then like we have like um, carpet and then like we have some plants as well. Um, and then for the food, we're not putting just some candies. We put like really, really good muffins that is known as the best muffin in Tanjong Pagar and in Singapore. Um, so yeah, we try to make them as comfortable as possible talking to us. Comfort food, yes. everything that makes you feel like you're at home. So after the welcome, we then jump into the more, we jump into the meat of the interview. We go into a dis discovery questions whereby we ask them about their habits, their problems, not directly of course, but involve based questions that we will touch on later. So we go on more to their like, what are your existing workflows? What are your existing challenges? How do you currently do this? Show me, etc. And then after that, following the discovery questions, usually um, we have either a usability test or a concept test or both. Whereby for usability testing, we try to test whether or not certain prototypes have any usability issues, or if we are exploring like more blue sky concepts that we're not even sure would work or not, we would do a concept test to just try to elicit a response from the interview to see like, how do they feel about it? Do they even understand the concept or the notion? And then after that, we do a debrief. We thank the, the interviewee for their time. Uh, we give them any tokens or uh, tokens of appreciation or incentive it was, if it was promised. Um, we wrap it up. We ask them, do you have any other comments for us? Any other questions for us? Because this question, usually the bonus questions or bonus comments are very insightful as well. And also because recruitment is so challenging, we ask them, would you be willing to take part in future sessions? And also, do you have any other friends, family members or colleagues that you might want to recommend for future interview sessions? To, to add about that particular question, so we always ask by in the end of the question, like um, whether you want to go on to the, uh, when you, whether you are interested to join our next interview session and whether you have friends or colleagues to be, to be referred to our interview session. It is also our retro process. So um, on my first few years of my research, I, I've got it to, when I asked the question, you, you would probably think people would say, ah, yes, yes, sure, obviously it's $50, so yeah, why not? But I've, I've got some people who would tell me no because apparently the whole experience in the research is not a good experience and they don't want to go through that research again. So it's also a good way for us as researchers to retro ourselves to see whether the experience is comfortable or good enough for the users. And whether they would like put that yeah, yes. to the same experience. Yes. So we've talked a lot about the um, introduction to uh, interviews, so like the plan, the recruitment, etc., etc. Now we're going to go a little bit more in depth into like, what's the craft of a question? Okay. Um, so when we talk about good questions, um, we always try to ask the past or uh, experience or existing experience. We don't really ask about future experience um, because that would be hypothetical. So we always try to talk the type of questions that typically we would ask about. Like, tell me about when you probably like buy this particular product or tell me about the last time you use our SP app. Um, what happened? What did you do next? So we're trying to go into the previous experience, although we always trying to get it um, probably less than three months because more than three months, most likely the memory will be a bit blurred. 
Um, so that's why we usually would put, uh, we always ask go to the previous, the previous experience because um, the previous experience is the easiest way to validate whether the user would go through the same experience again in the future. If the user has bought something in that particular price, then that would be probably the gauge of the price that we wouldn't <coughs> want to go. We were always trying to prioritize open-ended questions. Um, we o sometimes we use called closed-ended questions for the purpose of directing the conversation. But we always go for open-ended questions like, what do you think? Um, and then sometimes I would ask like a particular answer that they give. So why do you answer it that way? Why do you say something, something, something? So we always try to go for open-ended questions. We always ask naive questions as well. And by asking naive questions, I think it doesn't go just by asking the questions, but also your, um, your expression also shows that you are interested. You shouldn't have any judgments to your user. And then to, uh, a lot of the times I would ask the user why the thought process is like this. Why do you think that way? Why do you think this is not good? Um, so we always try, I think assume, uh, don't, don't assume. Um, and then you can always ask naive questions as well to the users. We use five whys as well. Um, we don't really put in the, what is it, in our plan, like we put like why, why, why until five times. Um, but there's, there are, I think it's more of a mindset. When you see something, when you hear, hear something from the user and then you think something is interesting, you ask why. Why, why, if there is a problem and then like you go into the root cause and then you realize, oh, this is a problem, this is the pain point. Um, so yeah, we often go, uh, we often go use five whys. Um, although it's more of a mindset, like I think, um, trying to be interested as much as possible to your users. Um, yeah, we also ask the users to think out loud. Um, when we ask the users to think out loud, we a lot of the times when we start our research, uh, we would tell the user, our, my, my typical welcome to the user is that, okay, so in this time, we're going to talk about this, 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 this. Um, and then we will ask some questions about this. We're going to show you some designs. When we show you some designs, um, we need you to think out loud. Um, when you're confused, when you think the design is bad, when, you're, when you have any comments about the designs, please let us know. None of us are researchers, so you, your comments won't offend any of us. So we're always trying to get the user to think out loud. Okay. Um, now I'm going, I was talking about the good questions. Now I'm going to go on with the bad questions. Um, bad questions typically, a, a very good example of bad question is leading questions. So, um, for example, like, you like using that feature X, don't you? Or why did you have a difficulty with task X? Um, we consider this as leading questions because um, usually we always go back into and see first whether the user actually using the feature X or not. Um, so you like using that feature X, don't you? So it's more like validating whether the user is actually do, using the feature or not. And it's leading the user, assuming that the user is using the feature. So we always start whether they're using the feature or not. When they use the feature, when was the last time they used the feature? And then we go through the whole process, like how was it? Um, how was the experience? What did you do? Why are you using your app? Um, and then like, how would you rate the experience with the feature X and then how can it be higher? So we don't assume as well that they have problems with the feature. Um, we always ask like, how was the experience and then how would, you, how would they rate it? Um, how can it be higher? And then we can see some improvement um, opportunities from that particular feature. Um, hypothetical question. So this is an actual question that I got from our, one of our stakeholders. Uh, one of our stakeholders asked us to ask the user, can you ask the user um, whether the user would change their appliances after 15, 15 years, for example? Um, I would say this is a hypothetical question um, because like, sometimes they haven't even replaced their, their washing machine or their home appliances. Um, or else, like, would you go to the store if you want to buy a TV? They haven't bought a TV. So why are we asking the question like whether they would go to a store or whether they would where that where are they going to buy the TV if they haven't go through the experience in buying a TV? So the typical question that we would ask um, instead of asking this question is that for example, when was the last time you replaced a home appliances? Um, and then typically they would say, oh, just um, last month. And then like, what was the device? Um, I just replaced my TV. Um, what happened? What did you replace it? So they usually they would say, oh, spark. 
So I talked to seven users, all of them say spoiled. So the whole thing, the hypothesis about um, reaching 15 years old and then they want to replace um, the device because it's old, apparently is already invalidated. Um, most of the people that we talked to, um, they replace the home appliances because it's spoiled or broken. Um, what happened? Why did you replace it? What was the new device? And then like, we want to see whether they replace it with the same thing or not. Because a lot of times, like, oh, uh, my Google Home is spoiled. And then in the end, they bought Alexa, for example. Um, and then why did you buy this new device? Um, and then how did you buy the device? Um, another assumption, which another, um, another example of bad question, which I find it as a researcher is very natural as well. I used to have embedded assumption and I used to have personal bias as well. For example, if there's few designs or few concepts that is produced, um, it's very natural for us researchers that we have a preference. But I think that's what's our job to be as neutral as possible as researchers. So um, we always try to make it, um, the, 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 when the question when we ask, like, what are the problems you face while using the app? Um, it's, you have this assumption or embedded assumption that pro user has problem using this app because you feel like the app is, the app, the app is bad and then like you, you immediately assume that all users would think that this app is bad, which I think is a very dangerous um, assumption. So again, we always go back to the previous experience. Um, when was the last time you used our app? Why did you use our app? How did you use our app? How would you rate the experience with app? How can it be higher? So uh, Nani talked about good and bad questions. So we also have some pretty standard questions when it comes to testing of design concepts. Uh, and so these are actually our standard questions that we ask you. So one way of testing design prototypes is to give people a task and see whether or not people can actually complete the task. Another way is to have standard questions like this. And the reason why we have this is so that anybody can quickly go out and do quick gorilla testing or like quick design concept testing for people. So the, the questions that we, we uh, standardize or emphasize uh, for some of our prototypes would be, is this what you expect it to be? Uh, what do you think this is? How can you tell what goes through your mind when you look at this? What other information are you looking for? And what would you uh, do next? Don't mind the grammar errors. Now I've pointed it out, everybody's going to try to look for the grammar errors. Um, anyway, so this, we found that having standard design questions, uh, standard design concept questions was also helpful for anybody to quickly test their uh, prototypes with colleagues or with random strangers at the lobby of the building whatsoever. So yeah, these are some of our design concept questions. Now, moving on to our favorite quiz time. <laughs> so it's been a lot of stuff that we've covered. Um, and uh, so now we're just going to do a quick little activity and uh, ask you all to read questions. So we're going to show you. We're going to give you a scenario and ask you to read whether these questions are good or bad. So if you think that these questions are good, just raise your hand. Um, if you don't think these questions are good, you don't have to do anything. Just keep your hands down. Now, as a researcher, I understand that that instruction itself is extremely biased because me as an audience, I would just like, ah, I don't want to do anything because if I'm wrong, nobody will see that I'm wrong. Um, but anyway, this is not a research study, so we're just going to do a quick update uh, on this. So, the scenario. Okay, the scenario is that you are the researcher or a designer for a well-known online retail shop, never mind which one, and you're trying to figure out whether or not this design concept actually works on people. So you're going to test, you want to test this design concept of people and see whether or not it works, are there any usability issues, for example. So, I'm going to give you your colleagues or team members have come up with certain questions that they want to ask the users, and you as a researcher are going to help them review the questions. So again, raise your hands if you think it's a good question. Don't do anything if you think this is not a good question. Okay, so number one, what do you think this is? Is this a good question to ask or a bad question to ask? And the answer is... Yeah, it's pretty okay. It's neutral, it's open-ended, and it will help to review the user's first impression of the concept. Shouldn't wait. Um, this one, I think, is a very good, very good question because when we produce concepts, there are a lot of times where... I, I've been into a few um, interviews when I ask this particular question about what do you think this is. Apparently, the users see the feature 
nothing like how we see the feature so this is a this is a page and then like this is a particular feature that we're trying to highlight and trying to test the user and then apparently when we show the user it's not visible at all to the feature um, so yeah this is something that we're trying to see first like what is the first impression um, and then like whether the what kind of um, perspective the user see the feature or the pages next one would you buy the, re the products that are recommended Yeah, this is, this is a pretty leading question. Uh, it assumes that the user will buy, use the recommended section to buy the product. It assumes that they will buy the product. There's a lot of assumptions baked into this one. Yeah, go ahead. So an alternative might simply be to ask them, what will you do next? And if they actually say, oh, I would buy the product, then OK, you might want to drill in a, a little more. How would you buy the products? Can you show me? Next one. If you want to add to cart, which one would you click? Bad. Bad. Yes. Depends on context. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So if it's out of the blue, it's a very bad question because all of a sudden you're just asking people like, hey, if you want to add to cart, which one would you click on? What What is the thing that you would do? So if it's out of the blue, then you're assuming that the next thing the user would do is actually to add the item to the cart. So. You might again want to ask, what would you do next? Why would it, depending on the text, why would it be good? If as a follow up, let's say, as, as I've mentioned just now, let's say the user has specifically said, oh, the next thing I would do is I want to add the cut. Um, and then you would say like, oh, as a researcher, you might want to ask, if you want to add the cut, then which one would you click? So you're asking them to show you a lot more detail. I think it's also part of active listening. So for example, like when they say, um, what would you do next? Oh, I'm going to research the product. And then it's, it's not going to the next question, but as a researcher, you should be more interested. Like, okay, if you wanna, if the next thing you wanna do is research more of the product, how are you going to do it? So I think you, again, is more like a five wise and also is active listening, as in like you um, refer back to the previous answer and then use it to understand more about um, their answer. So I did this question as a slight little trick question, um, purely because I also want to explain that sometimes the question by itself may not look like it's a good or a bad question, but if you take it into context, it has to make sense. As long as overall it's not eating, um, you're drilling in that uh, this question is actually okay. But of course, it can be further improved by saying like, just how would you do it instead of which one would you click? So which one you are already directing them maybe to a specific section by itself. Moving on, next one. What other information do you want to see in this page? Good or bad question? Good. Yes. Yep, it's a good question in the sense that it will review opportunities uh, on the content that we can add to this page. We'll find out like, what missing information there is that people expect to see, but it's not actually there. Next one. How many times a month do you usually go to this website? Okay. Actually, yeah. Um, so, as Nani mentioned, it's actually how do you define a month and which month are you referring to? So, it's actually easier for the user to recall his or her past experience rather than estimating occurrence. So, we're, sh we're showing you how to make this a lot better. So, for example, you might want to say specifically, last month, how many times did you go to this website? But I want to say this can be further improved. You can actually track it. If possible. <laughs> so this will not lie. Okay, even last month, I can't remember what I ate for lunch yesterday and you're asking me to remember last month. Uh, if you can just track it, please please go ahead. I think the easiest way as well to, to see whether this question is right or wrong is whether um, you use the same question to ask whether people go to gym or not. So like, um, how many time, how, how many times usually would go to gym? If you ask me, usually I would go probably like three times a week. But if you ask me last week, probably one time a week. So as in like, it's a very good example, like um, always go back to the, pre to the previous experience because user can always say whatever they want to say, but it's usually very different with what they're actually doing it. Like just now, um, while uh, Nicole and Alisa were conducting the Instagram workshop <laughs> over here, over here, uh, Nani and I were also having a conversation about our Instagram usage and figuring out, like, figuring out like how much time we actually spend on Instagram. I'm not going to reveal numbers by the way, <laughs> but we were like all estimating our own usage patterns, and when we went into Instagram app to actually track it, we were like, oh, our estimate is completely off. Just saying. So tracking it might be the best thing to do. So yeah, um, we just yeah. 
Any questions about writing questions a bit meta? About, yeah. Any questions so far? Yes. I've got one. So um, when you do a screener survey to recruit, have you ever had users come in and, and lie to you about using the product? Oh, sorry, user came in and it? So come in huh? and lie to you about using your product. And what have you done to make yourself that? Um, uh, yeah, okay, sorry. Um, the, the question was well, when we screened the user, when we called the user to come in, and then whether the user have ever lied using about our, your pro yes, our product, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, to be really honest, I've never got that particular experience, but I've got users who are disengaged in uh, answering the questions because they come in, they just want a $50. And usually we give the $50 in cash, which makes it even better, right? Um, we got that kind of users, we, it happens, but a lot of times when we get the user, so we went through the experience first and then we blocked backlist the user from our pool. So we removed them immediately from our pool. Um, but we've never, to be very honest, as in like me as a user, I don't know why I would li I would lie. And then usually like on the welcome, um, you know, the five pack interview, and then we all have the welcome section. In that particular section, is not only about setting the expectation. I think it's also to build relationship with you as a um, researcher and then as a user uh, with the user as well. So a lot of the times I would go to chat. So for example, like if it's an auntie or uncle, then I would talk to them and then like, oh, so how is it, uncle? And then like, uh, how is it your your holiday? And then like, blah blah blah. So in that like probably less than two minutes um, session, I would try to make that relationship and then trying to tell them that we are not we, we just want to talk to you and then we need you to be as honest as possible i think it's extremely important so previously i wasn't really i wasn't i thought like I, I would overlook at this um i wouldn't really tell them like i would just tell them like oh this is a research blah, blah blah and then like that's it i wouldn't make a uh interview i wouldn't make like a relationship particular relationship with them but there are times where i realized where an auntie came in and then like they very hesitant to talk to us and then we build the relationship and then like after one hour they don't want to go out from the room because they're still talking about it. oh my holiday yesterday uh, oh then i went to china and then like they all talk about everything about their previous experience which it's actually a very good sign for you as a researcher because you can make that particular relationship so i find that 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 um few minutes of chit chat um, whatever you call it, um, it's extremely important so that they can build their relationship so that you can assure them you can be just honest as possible um, and then like whatever you say won't offend anyone. Thank you. Yeah, so my question is, uh, I'm working on a product which is, um, as a product, it's pretty much a blank canvas which you can use to do anything, so it's very abstract in hmm. a sense. And uh, it's really hard if we ask these types of open-ended questions to get the specific feedback mm -hmm. that we want, because there's this, like this gazillion of different use cases that you that that you have. So if we talk to fifty different users, we would basically everyone would be talking about a different thing because mm -hmm. there's so many different things. Yep. So do you have any recommendations on how to kind of target the, the feedback to a specific? Uh, feature mm -hmm. of, your, of your product or like uh, give them a specific use case without li limiting their, their thinking. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so I think when we start, before we start the research, I think again, as Shion mentioned as well, I think it's extremely important for you to come up with the questions on your own as in like, what do you want to know? So that's why I think you come up with some behavior experiences that will be re relevant to your this particular product. Um, and then like we would go deep dive into that particular experience and then we go ask the users how was it and then you ask like step by step into like understanding the whole um, thought process of how the user go through the experience that's one uh, another one as well when we do use interview we don't purely just ask um, discovery questions we always come up with some designs even though there's no design workshop even though there's no design screen, we always try to come up with something um, because when we show the designs and then like it's in a way we're trying to see the reaction from it although I think showing the designs is an easier way rather than asking hypothetical questions. When we show the designs and then like we show sometimes a bit of the price, um, it's better and then see like their natural reaction rather than asking them, would you buy this product for $200, for example. Um, so yeah, we usually try to always, always try to come up with some designs first. Um, and then like from there, we try to get feedback. Even though the designs is not something that is aligned between the stakeholders, I think it's just a way to get feedback about the particular feature that you're thinking about to build. Yeah, I have a kind of follow-up question to that, which yeah. is, so we've been doing user 
testing with like like smaller groups of audience, such as like uh, people with disabilities, mm -hmm. and it's really hard to find users with the real experience mm -hmm. of using your product when mm -hmm. you go to like the very specific type of disability, for example. Mm -hmm. And and we've been having to run this this uh, test with hypothetical questions. Do so you have any any thoughts on how to run that type of tests or mm -hmm. or how to increase the scope of okay. like, the, the pool okay. of the, the like, audience? Do you want to answer? Is it's not it's hard users recruitment. So I haven't done any research in the past that specifically dealt with um, users with disabilities. Um, but hard to recruit users, I think that's an area that I've always been working with. Uh, generally, I think the only answer and consolation that I can give you is we just have to keep at it and be creative and don't lose patience um, because. Like for example, the the, recent, the the users that I'm trying to recruit right now, uh, Nani was helping me in the past, and she took three months to find three people. Yes. That's how long it took to find three people that we could actually speak to. And for myself, I was lucky. I took like one month to find two people. Um, so I think a lot of times when uh, the, the target interviewees are just hard to find, there's no way around it. You just have to be creative, keep figuring out like, okay, where would these people be? How can we ex increase our exposure there? How do we keep going? Um, to all of these this different events or locations that they might be at and just like keep banging our heads at the wall and see what happens. Like now, I, I sign up. Literally, my news feed is all about building management and building management in Singapore and like what are all the events in Singapore. And I'm just like, okay, this is good. I'm going to go for this event. This is good. I'm going to go for this event. I'm, I, look, I stick out like a sore thumb. I'm like the youngest person there most of the time. And I'm like, this young female there walking around like handing out my name cards and like trying to speak to people. And then a lot of time when they talk to you like what are you doing is yeah. extremely hard to explain. We are UX researcher, we want to talk to people and then they're like what is UX and I'm like uh, UX is... Um. <laughs> so yeah, it's just really awkward. What we're dealing with also as well is the yeah. language barrier. Yes. Many of them insist on speaking to me in Chinese so I speak Mandarin um, but I can't speak Mandarin for work <laughs> and so like this is just some of the things that we have to make use of. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah so I guess this is getting a bit annoying because like, I'm asking so many questions, but uh, just one final question is that, so do you think that asking those hypothetical questions if you don't have the pool of users, is it worse than not doing any, any type of uh, research with that type of users? Or like, is, it, is the data so biased that it's basically useless? So would you okay. rather just not do it at all? I would suggest to um, not to use hypothetical data. I would suggest to look into other sources of the data rather than interview. For example, if you have probably measured some measurement, then maybe you want to look at it. If there's existing papers, um, for example, like her, uh, probably the past few months, I don't know how many reports you've looked at. Um, but yeah, we even though we don't have the use, doesn't mean like we stop our research. A lot of the times we look at existing research that has been done in the space. So we looked at, you name it, Accenture, McKinsey, whatever research, particular research about this particular space, just to give us some understanding, even though it doesn't really answer our questions. Thank you. No worries. Yeah, let's move on. Um, we see some questions, we will get to them for some We will time. have some Q&A sessions, don't worry. Okay, um, we have some hands-on exercise, which you can refer to the handout, I think it's page 32, um, and I will show it to as well on this slide. Um, but yeah, so basically in this exercise, is it page 32? Okay, um, in, it's in the last slide, if I'm not mistaken, in the activities exercise section. Um, so, is, this is actually used to be, this is a real project that I used to work on um, and I don't have enough context as you are right now. Um, so basically in this scenario, we are building an EV charging station network in Singapore. Um, what we want to know is the current behaviors of cab drivers around EV, EV is electric vehicle, electric vehicle charging, problems and challenges towards charging an electric vehicle as a cab driver. <laughs> the target audience is cab and private hire car drivers through partnerships. Um, the constraint, one of the constraints is that you cannot disclose intent in built uh, charging station network as it is not published in the press. Next. So the exercise, there's post-its in your table and this is a group exercise so you can do it in a group. 
Um, use the big post-its to identify the objectives and then you can use the small post-its to map up the questions based on your objectives. You have 15 minutes. Before I start the timer, do you have any questions about the context? If you're confused, don't worry. I, I used to have this much of context when I, when I work on this particular research as well. Which but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I will start the timer. We have 15 minutes, so I will... Uh, can, can you have timer? Okay. Um, so you can start now. No, I think maybe it's the. I think it's the. They have a um, low five bits, low five bits. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> Sorry, yeah, we browse your playlist because this is an amazing playlist. I've been using it as well. Absolutely. Help you to focus. Okay. Um, wait, uh, let me check. So, the question for you guys, so I gave you the context which you can get in the handout as well. But basically, you can use the bigger post-its to come up with the objectives of the research. And then you can use the smaller post-its to come up with the interview questions that is based on the objectives. Is that clear? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, you can give so um, this cab drivers used to are uh, driving EV drivers at this point. So you can ask questions like um, how many like how many times yesterday do you charge your car, for example, or for example you can say like um, how many how many kilometers per day do you drive like yesterday for example. But be like. Objective, it could be anything. It could be up to you. As in, like, you want to learn about the pain points, you want to learn about the behavior, and specifically charging your car, for example. But it, it could be anything, and it's up to you guys. Let me know if you have questions again. What kind of cat are this is a, a group exercise, right? Is a what? Group exercise, yes. Without imposing the fact that the so I think the premise is you know, we know that they drive like yeah. So then we can ask about their experience driving and then we can ask about the whole story. And then also after they get to see the part about the, uh, how they charge and how they Any questions? Any questions? Is there something we want to achieve by asking this question? It's 
up to you. So as in, it could be, for example, like you want to learn about their behavior in charging EV. It could be about, I'd, I'd put a radio, so right? Learn about the current behavior and then if they have any problems or challenges in charging EV, for example. So you can branch away some of the objective from there. And then once you have your objective, and then trying to come up with some questions based on your objective. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay. Learn about current behavior in charging an electric vehicle as a chapter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how do you start? Uh, when was the last? Okay, so I would start with a welcome question. But the the, the, so the, the objective would be for you to see. <laughs> I think to this right, the team that went through the questions, mm. I think we gave probably how many? Three? Ten. Okay. Maybe ten people at each desk, so we should give ten. Oh, is it? Not, not everyone is ten. Okay, we should give the number that we have. So, one team only? Eh? Because we have limited. <laughs> yes, yes. yes. Okay. Uh, around nine more minutes. Okay, can. Our timing how? Uh? Should be enough. Uh? Six, right? Six or one hour. <laughs> okay, okay. Perfect. I think after this, we should be quite high, quite high again. And then there's demo, right? Demo people should find it quite funny. Yeah. Okay, we'll see all. After this is what? Conduct? The mood is later. And after the conducting the interview. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think also a lot of them a bit some of them a bit lost. Um I think can can go to the table. Some of them. I have a question. Yeah. So can we assume that the uh, people we are interviewing have they are already driving? Yes, EV they cars. have. Yes, they are driving EV cars. Sorry, I should have yeah. put it. Yeah, driving EV cars. Need to add one more context. They are driving EV cars. Hi, sorry. Um, I forgot one more context. Um, the people that you are going to interview are EV drivers. EV cab drivers. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> You can try to ask also back to the previous experience. So maybe like, um, when was the last time you charged your car? And then you go on with all of the um, follow-up questions from there.
Can yes. we have uh, like 10 minutes for just objectives or do we have to 15 the minutes with the questions. Ah, okay, for all making all the yes, questions. Yes. Objectives and specifics. You don't have to make as much uh, as much as many yeah. objectives as possible. I think um, you can come up with probably two objectives ah, then and then focus make... more on those right, objectives. Okay. I thought we had like 15 No 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 no. Don't worry. <laughs> Yeah. So I catch them out or where they live, or that if they're married or single. Yeah. So sometimes your database is incorrect. So yeah. I brought people in and was like, oh, you say you're single now? Yes. Oh yeah, we got divorced. It's like, so we had an old data. So, yeah. so just remember they are worth asking. Yeah. And okay. also relate. So tell us about your background. Sorry? Tell us about your background. Yeah. Oh, well, no, it could be very specific as in, are you, you know, are you married or how old are you? Um, yeah. it, it's like kind of... So you're trying to do Sorry, no, I'm not judging. Um, but if that makes it easier for you, you can try to come up probably with two or three objectives, yeah. and then just focus on that objectives. Okay. You don't have to complete yeah. the whole interview questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. We can probably just practice on behavior anyway. Right? Okay. So what, what are the things? Yeah. Kami kemarin mau datang juga. Iya, nggak jauh. Iya, maaf banget. Gak apa-apa, gak apa-apa. Nanti kalau mau tanya-tanya, tanya aja loh ya. Fuck the people recognize me. Four more minutes. Four more minutes, guys. No bad, no bad. Yeah. And they are standing up. When I worked on this EV, right, I was like you reading on the reports on EV to the point where I was about to go to the uh, physics car, whatever cost. I still understand. <laughs> it's sad, right? Eh? <laughs> you want to see like three more minutes? You can say all. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. Oh, I really got four minutes. Got really people here. Yeah. <laughs> How do you get exactly the segment? Where you unshot tips? How to not rate or okay, can I can answer both I think. I think when one of the user one of the team um talk, run through the questions right, I would ask the team to review. So that is more yeah. No one is a team. Okay, okay. You want to put it a bit later or not? On the last section. Yeah, I think I prefer put it on the last section. Let's hope less than 15 minutes. One minute. Can I check something real quick? <laughs> 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 
Ten seconds. Ten seconds left. Done. Okay. Yep. Time's up, guys. Time's up. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. The team on the corner over there. Time's up. Okay, so um, you guys have come up with the questions. What do you guys think about that? About the. We're not ready. <laughs> Sorry, the time is up. <laughs> Um, okay, I need one team to volunteer um, to run through the questions and objectives that they have. Any one team want to volunteer? Why no one one? <laughs> one, one. Uh, one team, do you guys want to volunteer? Okay, sure. Okay, um, so when, you, for, when this team is running through the questions and objectives, um, the other team, you can ask questions to this team as well. What, maybe like if you're interested on why you're asking these questions and everything. Okay, so because in the case when you, when you present your questions and where you show your plan to your stakeholders, there will be a lot of cases your stakeholders will ask questions as well on, on your questions. Oh, it's a bit meta, yeah. But um, your, your stakeholders are asking questions about your objectives and your questions and then there will be a lot of alignment process as well. So when they run through the objectives and questions, I want you guys to ask questions as well if you're interested to learn more about their questions. Okay? Okay. Can you go on? Okay, so there's a caveat that we don't have a lot of questions because there's a lot of follow-up questions to the questions that you want to ask. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So, um, so the behavior of charging, uh, we'll ask them about, tell me about the last time you charged your EV. Um, and some like, um, contextual questions as well, like how long have you been driving this EV? Um, why do you choose to drive EV? And then there's more questions about like charging, like how long does it take to charge? Um, how long does one charge last? What do you, like, um, if, so, so we found out from one of the people at this table that charging an EV takes about an hour and a half. So that's why I mean like follow up questions, mm -hmm. it's really important. So, what you do while you're charging is it mm. takes an hour and a half, right? Um, so, we might find a problem there, we might yep. not, yep. we don't know. So then, do you pay for it? Mm -hmm. um, how do you pay for it? Is there anything that you need to bring, like an equipment to charge? Um, <laughs> yep. And how do you find a charging station? Mm. And, and re regarding the payment for um, charging EV, if they do pay for it, then we'll ask like how much did you make last week as a private hire or a cab? Okay, okay. So then if it's, you know, we'll have to make sure that it's more than what they're paying to charge. Yeah. If not, then so that's Okay. Any questions from other team? <laughs> wow, stakeholders very nice, huh? <laughs> 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 okay, no, no, it's okay. Okay, so I think the question... Hello? Okay. So I think the questions that you guys mentioned is very, very good. Um, a lot of the questions is included in my research plan, in actual research plan, which I'm going to show you in a minute. But you guys got a present! Yay! Yay. <laughs> Sorry, it's only chocolates and some biscuits. So yeah, uh, note for you guys, if you guys um, uh, participated in our activity, we'll have some more chocolates as well. Okay, so next one, I'm going to run you through the questions that I asked. You can get the answers in this link.
sorry, I didn't put the questions um, on the handout because then you can see the answers, right? Um, but yeah, you can get the questions in this um, link. Ken, Ken, Ken. Ken. Ken, okay. Next. <laughs> okay, let's go. I will show you the questions as well in the slides. Okay, so um, we start with the objectives. Um, don't worry, when I start this project, I don't have, I didn't have any context at all about EV. I'm not even driving, as in I live in Nisha, I don't even drive in Nisha. I don't know how to drive, so I don't have enough context at all if, in driving plus in driving EV as well. So um, we start with the objective. So the objective at the time was exploratory learning about EV cab drivers. Um, learn about the lifestyle change from driving petrol car to EV. Um, and then we have some designs that we want to test to the users as well. Um, so we start with, I put some snippets of the questions. Actually, the questions is extremely long. Um, but I put some snippets of the questions. But we asked about like, um, when was the last time you charged your car? Um, how do you know you needed to charge your car? Because we want to see if it's they have a regular timing of charging EV or if they go when they feel like they need to charge their car based on the battery. And then what did you do next? So when they know like they, they have to go and then like what do they do next? Do they have like a specific charging stations they always go or they know a way to find the charging stations? And then we ask again like where is the station? Um, how do you know this station? Again, like we want to know how do they know the station? Is there an app? Is there a list? Because a charging station is not like a petrol car, uh, no charge, a pump. Yeah, petrol pump where it's available everywhere. And then like, why do you go to the station? Is it like a specific charging station that they always go? Um, or is it because like, there's amenities around? Because one of the hypotheses that the PO has at that time was that the charging station has to have a very good amenities around. So we want to check if that's the case. And we ask like, why do you go to this station? Um, do you always go to this station? Do you know how many charges in the station have? Because we want to know if they go, um, if they go to a specific place, do they know whether, whether the charges are available or not at that time? Um, how do they know if the charges are available? Um, what do you do if the station is full? This particular, sorry, this particular question is actually a question for us to validate because they have um, a concept or hypothesis at the time to build a feature to um, not chop, uh, book, book the charging station. Um, because we are thinking maybe the drivers, um, they have to queue for the charging stations. So that's why, like, what do you do if the station is full? And then the answers for all of the drivers, actually, apparently, that's not the case. They never really have to um, queue for a charging station because there hasn't been a case where the charging stations are full. And then what charges do you use? Because our, um, actually, this one is, um, so because we want to see when we do filters on the app, um, how, what kind of filter should we use? Is it like ACDC? Is it the speed of the charging station? So that's why we put like what charging do you use? And then we put on the bracket as in like for us as the researchers to, to, to put. And then apparently they don't even know ACDC. They only know the plot type. So they see like this plot type or this plot type. So um, whether it's AC or DC, apparently it doesn't really matter for them. And then how do you know if it's ACDC? Um, and then apparently they don't know if, whether it's AC or DC. Um, how long did it take to charge? And then how often do you charge your car? Whether they have a specific timing? Um, and then how, what do you do during that time? Again, because we have this specific hypothesis where amenities around is extremely important, but apparently they don't, it, it, at that time it wasn't really important because apparently when they charge the car, a bit sad, but when they charge the car, they sometimes sleep in the car. So apparently there's a lot of cases where um, the charging station, um, uh, when there are slow charging stations and it would took them about two and a half hours to charge. So what they do is that when, before they go out to drive, um, at 3 a.m. in the morning, they would bring their pillow and then blanket and then they would put it in the car and then when they charge the car and they sleep inside the car. Uh, so there are cases like that as well. And then like, what do you do during that time? When to collect the car? Because our assumption is that when they go charge the car and then took two hours and then like they go out, how do they know that the charging is full? Because at this point currently, there's no way to see, um, to connect the, the technology to connect the car and the app as well to see the battery um, progress, charging progress. And then like, how do you decide when to collect the car? <coughs> oh yeah, question, sorry. Yeah, um, even like how often one of the questions not asked? Sorry? Even the film, like how often one of the questions Yes, yes, so good, very good catch. Um, <laughs> 
So yeah, um, initially we trying to get uh, based on yesterday as well. Um, I think it's more on the hypothesis that we had at that time is two days, eh, one and two days. And I would say, I think that's why if we say like yesterday, and then I'm scared that I wouldn't get the, the previous day. Although when we asked this question, we realized apparently at that time, because there's slow chargers, they have to charge every single day. Um, but yeah, this is a wrong question. And we should have asked probably this week, how many times you charge your car. And then maybe when they say five times, five times throughout what consecutive days? Is it like two, two days a week? Is it like every day? What, what is the setup at that point? Yeah. So, and then do you remember how much does it cost? And then like, how do you pay? Do they pay like cash? Or do they pay like using credit card? Because all of these questions, we don't have the, the answers to the insights at that point. And then how long and how far can you drive after you charge your car? Because you want to see whether they can gauge um, whether it's when it's full tank and then like how long they can charge the car. And then where else do you want to see charging stations? And this is something that is part of our planning, whether when, where we should plan more charging stations in Singapore. So, okay. So, um, one of the things about uh, Nanning's research as well is also that there's not a lot of tracking that we can rely on. So sometimes we do have to go back to estimates, unfortunately. So this is, I think, this goes back to the point where we were saying like, yeah, some questions we know are bad, but sometimes you still have to ask it anyway. So that it actually depends a lot on context. So as much as possible, try to get accurate insights. But when it's really not possible, we do have to fall back on certain things. Yeah, but. This is the nature of qualitative research. Anyway, um, another example, so from, from the B2B side of things in SP Digital, uh, as I mentioned, I do utility management. Um, I research around behaviors and workflows and challenges for utility management and commercial buildings. So uh, the stuff that I have to find out would be like, what's the importance, effort, and process around utility management and commercial buildings such as this one? Do people even care on the data side? I don't care how much my electricity, water costs in this building. I, just make it as pain-free as possible, or is it currently pain-free, is it, are there any challenges at the moment? So we're just gonna show you some example questions that we have to give you a sense. So we know very little, um, when it comes to B2B, sometimes we know very, very little about the workflow, so we have to fly quite blind, and the questions that we come up with are often very, very open-ended, and they serve more as a conversation guide, rather than a definite, you must ask this kind of thing. So here are just some example questions that we have. So usually, um, when we're trying to investigate utility management, uh, I will start off with by a, a very open question. How do you currently monitor your building energy water consumption? And then, uh, if they start rambling on, I will skip a lot of my future questions. But if they don't, and they need more prompts, then I'll use this as a conversational guide to help myself, help remind myself, like, okay, these are the areas that I need to probe into. So when it comes to commercial building utilities, actually there are a lot of different areas that you can go into. There are tenanted areas, commercial areas, uh, 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 common areas, sorry. Like for example, if you walk out, who do the toilets belong to? Do they belong to the building owner or do they belong to the tenants? Um, there are also things like, what's the software that's been used? Um, when you're monitoring utilities, you can monitor the absolute amount or you can monitor the monetary amount. So the first question that you ask is deliberately open just to set the ground stage and see what's on top of their mind. So we ask, how do you currently monitor your building and energy water consumption? And then after that, if they don't uh, talk about certain things, we start to put more like, are there specific areas you monitor? How do you break down the consumption? To figure out like, in their mind, for such a big buildings, how do they break things down? And then could you run me through the process? How do you do it? We ask them to show us their process. And then we also ask them like, if they are monitoring, then why do you monitor? If they are not monitoring, why are they not monitoring? What do they do after all the monitoring is done? Um, and then we also ask, if they don't talk about the money, stuff, uh, money side of things, we ask them, out of your expenses, roughly how much does energy water consumption take up? So this is an interesting question because sometimes it gets building managers on the defense. Whenever we're talking about money, people are like, why do we need, about, need to know about this money amount, monetary amount? This is also why we kind of embedded uh, towards the middle a little bit, where we have a sense of like how comfortable the building manager is at the moment. And then, uh, since we started talking about money, then we will start asking a little bit more, like how do you track your bills right now? Do you plan? Is there any planning that happens? Um, if you're not currently doing any monitoring of your above, are there any plans? As I mentioned, we, we treat um, CNI, uh, utility management for commercial building um, more, we, we treat questions for uh, commercial buildings more as a conversational guide because 
uh, we really are very clueless about not so not so much anymore, but we really were very clueless about all the processes and workflows that people have. So that's why like some of our questions are not very well organized and we just like, oh it's a it's a problem. I I should ask this thing now. A lot of times as well before this is before the time before you join. Um, I was the I was the one who was doing this interview and then like at the time it's extremely hard to catch the domain language as well because um, it's all about electricity, energy and physics and everything. Um, and then like I think when you say like I, I ask too much of naive questions as well and then like a lot of times when the first interview I really remember the first interview that I had with the building manager um, when I asked the question and then like he was like duh like he, they were, he was really questioning like why are you asking this stupid question but I think like it's also important for you to in a way like test the questions as well so like after when you do the interview and then you kind of gauge the opinion from the user whether your questions are right or wrong and then after that you can iterate your questions that. So, yeah, so <laughs> with qualitative research, it's really a bit of a balancing act. You want to be naive, but at the same time, you don't want that you to think that you're an idiot because then you will like, yes. be totally condescending and like, don't waste my time. This is a useless interview. So, uh, following up, we also ask questions like, do you monitor your tenants' consumption of news? So now we're moving on to like more specific areas. And if you're not currently monitoring your tenants' consumption of news, are there any plans for doing this? Why or why not are you monitoring this? How do you consolidate all of this monitoring that they're doing? So again, it's a conversation we like very often during the actual interview. Um, we will add on a lot more questions. We will skip questions and stuff. Yeah. So now okay. we move on to uh, tips on conducting a user interview. Uh. Again, um, as part of the research ops, I would say, um, we do a lot of things to try to make sure that we um, make the process faster from um, having email templates, from, um, what is it again? Oh, having a user pool. We even have a huge checklist, which you can get in the handout on page 19. There's a link over there. But we have a template of checklist where you can download and then you can try to adapt it and then use it yourself. We have a checklist of like, before interview and then like um, two or three days before interview, during the interview, okay, after the number one, the first rule of thumb again is something that was mentioned. Trust is the overarching objective. You have to get the interview you trust you because otherwise they're not going to share every single thought with you. They're just going to give you one-liner answers. You ask a question, they're going to give you a one-liner answer and it's going to be so dry, so boring and your interview is going to be a waste of time for both you and interviewee. So Sorry, um, to, to give you some example as well, when I when I talked to one of the EV driver at the time, when they came in, one of them, they came in into the, the room and then they were like, what the hell is this? Like, why, why am I supposed to be here? Why you call me? And then like, they sit here and then I, pre I present to them, oh yeah, so I'm Nani, I'm researcher, blah, 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 blah. Um, in this interview, we're going to ask questions, blah, blah, blah. Um, in the meantime, uh, these are some snacks that you have. These are some muffins. These are very good muffins and it's very warm. Then you know what he did? He get all the f he get all the muffins and he get all the snacks. And say, wow, this is very good. I haven't got lunch. Then he take all the muffins and then he asks, okay, you ask me anything. <laughs> so you realize that basically the whole, the whole, just a small thing as you can, can give like by providing a good food and then maybe like making them comfortable and trust you, I think is extremely um, important to make to make you smoothen the interview as well. So try not to be judgmental. Mm. Actually, don't be judgmental. Yeah. Uh, whatever they say, nothing nothing that comes off your off your mouth is stupid. They are the most for that hour or and it's that hour in the hub. They are the most interesting person in the world, and you want to do nothing else but listen to them. Okay, just make them feel trust, tr trusted. Um, make them feel safe. Okay, nothing is going to go wrong in that room. Second rule of thumb. Uh, try to show, get participants to show you. I think we covered this earlier on when we were talking about um, the questions as well. Try to get people to show you their process, ask them to walk you through, ask them to click through the apps if they mention certain things that they like or dislike, ask them to show it, sh show it to you so that you know exactly what they're talking about and there's no misunderstanding whatsoever. The next thing is something that I think we've also touched upon, build rapport. So, like I said, some of the interviewees that I um, interview, sometimes they speak Mandarin. I don't speak Mandarin for work well. Okay, I speak Mandarin well in my in my home, but I don't speak Mandarin well for work. But to build rapport, sometimes I have to go into full-on Chinese interviewer mode, and I'm just like, <coughs> sorry, sorry for the non-Chinese people, uh, non-Chinese speaking people. But sometimes you just have to switch, do whatever it takes to build a rapport. Sometimes I go into full Singlish mode, 
Um, I am a very quiet and introverted person by, again, by nature and nature. And there was once this interviewee, and he came into the room, he was like, open the door, and he was like, hey, how are you? And I was like, jala. <laughs> And for the whole session, I had to be like, yeah, 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 yeah that's really awesome, can you show me how you do it? After that hour, I just went back, I couldn't talk to anyone, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have to yeah. match their energy levels and like, just try to make them feel comfortable. I have, yeah, I'm not very good with Singlish, even though I'm Singaporean, but I also have to go into like, can you, uh, that was really good, can you show me how you, I can't do it in front of all you, know, but you can know, go into like Singlish mode and all the different kind of things. So yeah, build rapport, um, mind the gap. Uh, it relates to point number two on show. So sometimes what people say and what people do may not be the same. Uh, I'm going to tell you, like, my colleagues suggest lunch locations for me all the time. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm going to tell you that I'm usually okay with all lunch locations. So I'll be like, yeah, I'm fine with anywhere for lunch. And then when they suggest something, I'll be like, mm, no, no, no one, no one. Or they, they'll, tell, they'll ask me like, if she knew I would do this, I'll be like, yeah, 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 I, I definitely would. So they're asking me a hypothetical stuff, or like they're asking me a question, and I'll say like, yeah, this sounds like a fun activity, I'll do it. But when it actually comes to doing it, I'll be like, oh, no, no one. <laughs> so what people say and what people do may not be the same. So you always have to be very mindful that, yeah, whatever they say, you have to use your good judgment um, a little bit and try to ask people to show you as much as possible. <coughs> yeah, and allow for awkward pauses like this. Um, I think probably not in this culture, but I'm not sure, I'm not sure if uh, it's a cultural thing or whatnot. Uh, personally for me, uh, I'm very okay with silences, but I do have friends who cannot bear silence. And when I see them interviewing, they're just like cutting in all the time and leaving no space for the interviewee to actually get a single word out of their mouth. So in interviews, pauses are fine. Let the interviewee collect their thoughts, let the interviewee have silence to think, and sometimes having awkward pauses, and it's good in the sense that your interviewee may be someone who cannot take awkward pauses, and they will be the ones rushing to fill in all the silence by giving you even more stuff that they, you didn't even ask them about. So allow for awkward pauses. So yeah, uh, we've talked about a little bit about rules of thumbs or guidelines uh, for conducting interviews, then how do we take notes? Okay, so this is our method for taking notes. When I first joined, I was super impressed with this. Uh, but like previously, uh, this was not, not how I took notes. So your method and knowledge may be, you may be using different tools or whatnot, but um, in SP Digital, how we take notes is basically we make use of a giant, giant is underestimating it, a ginormous <laughs> spreadsheet that looks like this. So we basically fill in the first uh, role with the user's name, and then we have questions on the first column. So, for example, let's say I'm doing a research project on some very familiar names <coughs> like Harry, Hermione, Ronald, Luke, and Ray. <coughs> I wonder where they come from. Um, and our questions would be, tell me about yourself, how long you've been, what are some of your challenges, what do you love most about you? So, so the questions will be on the first <coughs> column, and you can see them easily. And then when it comes to the relevant uh, interviewee for interviews, we would hide the column appropriately and show only the ones that we are interested in. So. Um, and we'll talk a lot more about this later on, but now moving on, what do we fill into each of the cells? Yep, so basically in terms of note-taking, so um, we try to make our note-taking more so that we can eliminate the transcribe process because on transcribing process is extremely um, time-consuming um, because it would double your work as well. Um, if the recording takes, for example, like about two hour, one hour, that means you have to add another one hour just to listen to the people and then plus the pauses and everything just to like make sure like, you really listen. So we try to make our note taking extremely comprehensive so that to the point where we are currently right now, we can really eliminate the recording process because our note taking is quite comprehensive. So, but the principle, uh, the, the rule of thumb, it, again, the guide for our process is that we take everything that actually happened in the first person uh, format. Um, for example, I think um, a lot of, like as a researcher, most likely um, we will think about like um, 
things to improve when you get the comments from the user. I think the goal of this whole note taking process is that is more on you trying to you trying to record everything that happened and then you will put your thoughts and summarize it when you're cleaning up the the data. So for example, like we need to use different colors to make CDA more visible. Um, Usually we will put like, for example, a lot of times when the users see the design and then they are confused, their eyebrows are frowning. So then we will put like interviewee is confused and couldn't find the, the button. That's where, that's how we put it. Instead of putting a solution on the, on the note itself. And then for example, like if she wants to eat chicken rice. Um, this is not how we are going to usually take the note. How we usually put it is that exactly how they would put it. So for example, like, what do I want to eat? Ah? Mm, I think roast duck. Ah. Uh, no, 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 chicken rice. Ah, yes, 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 chicken rice. So we always put exactly what they're talking about because of how, how they talk through it. Because we realize when we put all the expression and even like the, the pauses and everything, we, will, we can gauge how strong the opinion is when, they, when we see the note back again, when we cleaning up the data. Um, this page is not bad. Lah. So um, this is actually we, um, we eliminating the awkward pauses. So... Um, for example, like if there's a long pause, then we put it. So this page, ah yeah, not bad lah. So you really put into everything, and even in the awkward pauses, so that we can see that actually to come up with this particular opinion, um, it take the user quite some time um, to to come up with that particular opinion because. When you see this and you see the bottom right, you realize apparently on the bottom that user put probably some, he's is maybe trying to be nice. He's trying, maybe trying to filter some of the words that he's trying to put. That's why he put not bad lah, but actually maybe for his thought is quite bad, for example. So this is an example of um, raw data that we usually have. The thing, and then we, should thank Shein for uh, faking this data because she have to go through the whole storytelling process. But yeah, um, so typically this is the raw data. And, oh, okay, oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, so the note taking usually will be something like this. And then um, after this session, I will go through on how to clean up the data. So next one will be conducting an interview. So this time it will be a role play of interview. Who wants to volunteer to be interviewed by me? Uh, what is involved? <laughs> yes, um, it will be a ten, probably ten to fifteen questions about smart home devices. Anyone want to volunteer? Yes, thank you. Give an applause. <laughs> eh, my script. Heaven, heaven, Peter. <coughs> ah, yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, no problem. Okay, so um, in this session, oh, my name is Naning. I'm a researcher from SP Digital. Um, um, in this session, um, I'm going to talk to you about um, asking questions about smart home devices. Mm -hmm. So more about like um, what devices that you have, and then probably your buying process, and then like how you install it. Um, the whole session probably will take about an hour. Obviously, not an hour in the session, but yeah, um, the whole <laughs> session it will take about an hour. Um, and then I'm going to show you some designs as well. There's no designs. Uh, I'm going to show you some designs as well. Um, and then when I show you the designs, it's meant to be testing the designs, not you. So I need you to be as honest as possible. Um, none of us here are the designers. So usually there will be an observer over here. And then obviously in this demo, there's only me. Um, but yeah, um, it, whatever you say, if it's confusing, if it's very bad, if it's very ugly, you can just say anything that you like, okay? Okay. okay. So we will start first on the process on um, a smart home. Mm -hmm. So what is a smart home to you? Uh, it's the ability to control different features of the home, like mm -hmm. lighting or um, air conditioning, things like that, mm -hmm. um, digitally mm -hmm. and conveniently. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you own any smart home devices? I have a Google Home Assistant. Right okay. Now. Okay. Um, which is the device that, as in, do you have any other <coughs> devices other than Google Home? Um, no. No, okay. Um, so, probably last week, how, do you, how many times do you use Google Home? Every day. Every day, okay. Um, and then Google Home, I assume Google Home is the last, time, the, the last item that you buy for a smart home device? Yeah. Okay. Um, when did you buy Google? Oh, sorry, I just remembered. <laughs> ah, okay, okay, there is. Um, I have smart light bulbs. Okay. Yeah. So the last device that you buy was the light bulb. The light bulb. Okay, but the one that you use the most? Uh, the Google. Google. Yeah. All right. 
Okay, perfect. Um, and then for the light bulb, when did you buy it? Uh, like over a month ago. Over a month ago, okay. Um, and then why did you buy the smart light bulb? Because uh, it was compatible uh -huh. with the Google Home and then you can just tell it to turn on or off or set it to different times okay. uh, to turn on or off, different colors. Cool. Okay, <laughs> good. I think it's cool as well. Um, and then what was your expectation before you buy the bulb? That it would be easy to set up mm -hmm. and uh, it would work fine. Okay, and then when was the last time you used it? Um, probably almost every day. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so may I know the brand of the the light bulb? Um, it's, uh, I think it was a Philips. Philips Hue. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, how did you decide on Philips Hue? I just went on Amazon. So okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I think that was one that one of my friends had, and mm -hmm. he uses it. So. Okay. So it's more on because it's in Amazon and then plus your yeah, friend. Like it was easy to find mm -hmm. and uh, I know people who had used it before and then liked it. Okay, okay. And the price point was good. Okay. Um, and then when you say like the price point is good, how much did you buy for it? Um, so actually my, my boyfriend bought it mm -hmm. for me, so that's yeah. why the price point was good. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. But I would expect it would be like... In, so I'm actually from Canada. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's like around fifty dollars or fifty dollars so for a pack. Yeah. All right, all right. Um, and then like you mentioned, your boyfriend bought it. But how do you do? You know how did he buy it? Amazon. He Amazon. Amazon. Okay, okay. Um, I know your boyfriend is the one that is buying. But how do you? How would you rate the buying process? Or maybe like how, what, what, did your boyfriend give any comments about the buying process in Amazon? Yeah, it's pretty se seamless. It's just like, um, you can use Amazon Prime, you get two-day delivery. Uh -huh. um, all the payment information is there already, so you just pretty much click and go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So, I'm going to go on with the installation, um, the process on installing the light bulb. But, um, so how did you set it up? Uh, it's very easy. You just take it out of mm -hmm. the packaging yep. and then um, screw it in. And, mm -hmm. then, and uh, from what I remember, it was just linking it to the Google Assistant device okay. on your phone. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, how long did it take for you to set up? Like under ten minutes. Ten minutes. Like oh, that's quite almost, fast. Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't very long. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so after you install it, it took ten minutes, and then after you install it, and then what did you do afterwards? I just turned, uh, asked the Google uh -huh. Home to turn it on and yep. off. Yep. Okay. Um, colors, try different colors. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. That's cool. Um, but what do you think about the installation process? I thought it was pretty simple. Uh -huh. um, no complaints mm. that I can remember. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think that's it um, for all the questions that I have. But which will be keen to be part of our research in the future. It will be something like this, as in like you'll be an hour. Okay, yes. that's good. Um, and then do you have any friends or family that would be you would recommend to join this session in sure. the future? Yeah. Okay, that's all. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. See? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is for you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Um, what do you guys think about that session? Great job. Oh, thank you. Oh, sorry. I go next person. But yeah, what do you think? Any comments can be as harsh as possible. I'm a researcher, very used to harsh comments. But yeah, any comments, any questions about the whole session? Yes. Yeah, so, so you mentioned that none of you are designers in that session. And yep. it's free to talk. Yeah, and a lot of times I'm lying. Because usually the observer are the designer. Um, yeah. But yeah, usually you will tell that. Oh, so you I always tell, yeah, I always tell that none of us, none of us are the designers. Um, and usually that's not the case. So usually either me, so um, as a researcher, we always try to get the designer to be part of the research process as well. So that's why um, usually, for example, if there's like four interviews in a day, and then we know that the researcher, for example, is me, and then like the observer, the one who take the notes is the designer, for example, and then we just switch turns. So there are times where the designers who would take the lead on the research, on the interview, um, and then like, he would tell the same thing. None of us are designer, which actually he's a designer. 
but yeah, um, we always trying to say like that because we want to assure that the the user can say as as they can be as confident as possible when they give the feedback. I think for for commercial, it may be slightly different because oh, yeah, yeah. when they look at professionals, uh, yeah. So for professionals, sometimes they may want to add us on LinkedIn, so we can't lie. Yeah. Uh, so for for B two B side of things, we don't lie. We actually just say like you can be as honest as possible. Please don't worry about hurting our feelings. You won't get offended. It's actually helpful if you are as brutal and honest as possible. So yeah, it also depends a lot on the context. So with politics, it really depends a lot on the context. Yeah. That's happening. Yeah. I don't think you need to lie. You can actually get it recorded and just get the the designer to look at it. Because a oh. note taker could be a research uh, assistant. Oh, okay. So yeah. Um, usually, for as a researcher, we always try to get the designer to be um, as a they can see the opinion as in first hand. Although, although we as we try to get the note taking process as comprehensive as possible, they should be able to get kind of get gauge the expression of the user when they give that okay, comments we'll do the video recording. we don't record anymore so for us because we, we believe that putting the camera um would would give like the pressure for the user that they see that this camera over here um so that's why we don't really record anymore we do cast it but the cast we cast it using like a webcam um, and then the webcam is on the wall um, so they don't really realize it that there's a cam and then it's casted but it's, the purpose is more on the casting it to the team but we don't really record it anymore right now we only use the note taking that we have the recording uh, so the comment about recording is an interesting one so uh, we for, for my interviews because sometimes the building managers that we want to interview will suddenly bring their colleagues along so it, it will turn out from a it will more from a one person user interview into a five person group interview and I'm like not taking for this is impossible um, so we actually do request for recordings at times but we do notice that whenever you request for recordings people are a little bit more uptight yes so it affects a lot that's why I think for for our case, we don't record things. We we do have to record at times, but we, we try not to um, where where it's possible to avoid. Yeah. So for my case, when it's like a five person, I'm like I, I I'm sorry, I have to record this because this is too many people. I cannot take the notes for this. So we do record on her side. Um, since it's perfectly fine to go without recording. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Yep. Hi, I'd like to ask, um, well, I've experienced user research, um, and it's a similar one, like, the respondent will um, answer in some cases that somebody else had the journey or the experience, like she mentioned her boyfriend, hmm. and um, so would you continue with the questions if yeah. that happens, yeah. or would it be, like, ac so accurate, like, the answers, and how would you, like, Okay. Um, so yeah, you can see as well from from because like when when they, she answered that particular question, I have it on my list that what there I'm supposed to ask like so how was the experience, how would you rate it, and then how can it be higher? But then it's not her experience. I think it depends on that particular experience. So I think what I should have asked her at that point because I believe that you should have bought something from Amazon for something else recently as well, right? Yeah. yeah. So I think I should have asked that particular question that is similar, maybe not like Bob, but as in like the same experience as in like shopping something in Amazon. So maybe I should refer it to something else, but then it's still in the same context. Um, although I wasn't sure at the time, so I wasn't asking the question. But yeah, um, I think trying to get something that is more similar. But if it's someone else, for example, like her boyfriend bought it maybe like six months ago, and then she wasn't even there when when he bought the when he bought the light bulb. Then I wouldn't ask the question because she wouldn't even aware about the whole experience. Any other questions? Do you ever follow up uh, for like clarification mm -hmm. on questions? Uh, can you give me an example? Like after the interview, looking through notes, and then you realize, oh hey, maybe. Oh. Um, so after the interview, perhaps yep. you're looking through your notes, yep. and um, maybe you missed something, or you would like to clarify something. Okay. Okay. Um, yes, I sometimes uh, rarely happen for me. Maybe something that would happen a lot for Xu Yun, but for me, it doesn't really happen. Um, I think it happens maybe twice or three times um, previously that I would email them, and then we can't really call them because in Singapore there's this no call registry, and then like if you call this particular person, the person uh, without her, the person's consent, then the person can report you to the police. Um, so that's why we really, really trying to avoid calling them, and we usually will try to email them. Um, just referring to your particular interview, you answer this question. Can we get more details about it? Then they would answer through email. 
So, yeah. so for the commercial side, because uh, interviewees are harder to recruit, so each of them are very precious. So we do follow up, usually follow up uh, via email. Um, so interestingly, uh, professional inf contact information is not so uh, it's not as sensitive as personal, personally identifiable information. Mm -hmm. So we can actually call them. So it's slight difference over here. Yeah, yeah. I can actually call them, and a lot of the building managers that we interview actually prefer that we call them to follow up, and they also feel like it's a more personable relationship. For you. I think for that context also is because like the person probably give a name card mm -hmm. and then so that is you can see it as a concern that the user gave um, the phone number but for us for residents um, if they never give their phone number and then we suddenly call them I think they could really report us to the police and then we can get really into a big trouble okay you have and one last question yes no actually I yeah, follow with the, uh, yep. the answer that you have uh, following up question I thought was not a very good idea um, the following up question was mm, for me it's not a very good idea because when you conduct an interview or research you have a context to it mm. when you start following up the person have woke up from the context oh, and okay. the, res the data collected might be different from your actual research mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it will misinterpret some of your, your result of your user research okay uh, to follow up, to, to give you more context about the previous experience that I have, um, the, the, I think the question that I have at that time was, I was asking them about, um, the, it's an EV driver, so I was asking them about their particular car and then the particular charging um, type. Um, and then I was asking that question because it's more of a functionality questions that she should know already. Um, and then we when we catch, we actually catch the answer. It's just like the person who take the notes didn't have that enough technical knowledge to take the note on that particular brand or name that they put off. So that's why we follow up because we're trying to get more exact answer for that. But yeah, I agree with your point. Yeah. Also agree. So uh, in my case, um, whenever we follow up, usually it's because the point that is mentioned is very, very technical. And we realize that after doing our own research, we still don't understand, understand the term, for mm. example. So we will reach out to the interviewee to ask them to explain more. That's the first case. The other situation is, let's say the interviewee actually promised to follow up. So sometimes our interviewees will say like, I'll send you this information, and then they don't. And so we will actually follow up and say like, hey, you mentioned this during the interview, would you mind elaborating more and co continuing the conversation? So those are the two situations where we will actually follow up. Yeah. Yep. So moving on. Okay. Okay, so we've gone through the last section yeah um we've gone through, i was about to say halfway but actually it's not halfway this is the last one um but yeah we'll, we'll be talking now about generating insights and reporting findings we've talked about like planning um conducting it and then now we're talking about analyzing it so the process when, when you have this um all of this data i think is more about like analyzing it uh, i was talking to shun about um when we when we craft this whole um, workshop material <laughs> I really want to deep dive a bit about into this because I think there's not enough um, as in like when you Google, when you go to internet and then you look into the research process, um, articles or medium blogs, a lot of them talking a bit high level, talking about like, oh, you should do the interview like this, 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 but no one's really talking deep dive from how to, on how to take notes and then after that and then what. So um, we realized in terms of analyzing the insights, it could be divided into four process, which is um, capture, which for us, I think in our context is more on like, for example, the finding spreadsheet um, and then connect, um, connecting the insights, trying to find common themes and then we craft the insights um, in, when, to share it to, with others and then story tell, story tell as in like you have the insights and then how you to make it compelling with other people on your stakeholders. So. Um, as a researcher, I think like we shouldn't just focus on qualitative, we should look into quantitative. Um, for our case, uh, we use Google Analytics for our quantitative. And I would say, I think um, as a researcher, we should, we should consider, not consider, but treat um, qualitative data the same as quantitative data so that we can spend more time not only on qualitative things, but also quantitative data. So in terms of capture for user interview, I would take example user interview and an Google Analytics for um, the quantitative part. So capturing for us probably is like note taking for interview and then analytics is probably like a dashboard that you have. 
Um, and then like when it comes to connect and then we will have the comprehensive findings that we have cleaned up um, based on the raw findings, which you can, which I will go through after this. Um, and then in terms of analytics, when you have a dashboard and then you want to see more about that particular number and then you will deep dive and then probably you, will, for us, we have a spreadsheet, which I will go through <laughs> later on as well. Um, once you have a finding, you will try to connect the dots, you will try to see the common themes and then you're trying to see, um, connect the themes that you have and then find key themes and then come up with some insights and then after that is more on a reporting and storytelling process. So previously I've talked about note taking and then uh, the note, when the note taking is still raw, um, it's very hard to compare between each of the, each of the findings, each of the comments. So for example, when we say, well, like, tell me about yourself, when everything is on two paragraphs, it is, it is extremely hard for us to compare between each of the answer. So that's why usually after we do note taking, we try to clean up when, clean up means like we summarize the findings, we try to highlight the main answers of that particular answer. And then like sometimes the user would answer, um, would answer a particular question, which the answer already answering um, the next few questions. So when we do clean up, we try to split it into multiple answers and then we try to put it into the, the right um, questions and the right columns. So um, this is an example of our cleaned up um, interview. So these are the questions and the blue ones is the, what is it, the answers for, the, the, sum, the summary for each of the answers. So for example, like how long and how far can you drive after you charge a car, for example. Initially, before we summarize it, it's quite hard to read, the, to find out a summary, to, to, to come up with a conclusion based on the answers because this one is like two paragraphs, one paragraph, one, one sentence and whatever. So that's why it makes it easier, 370 kilos, 350 kilos, below 330, 300 kilos. So for us to come up with a conclusion for this particular question is much easier. And the same with the rest of the questions. Yeah, you are, me. Oh. Um, and then... Sometimes when we do this, when we've cleaned up the interview, um, for us usually in the, the most cases of research, we would come up with the insights on our own. But in times where you wanna bring more people in, um, wanna bring more stakeholders into the process, you can try to do, um, come up with the key themes um, using post-its and together with your, um, what is it, stakeholders. Like for example, like this one. Yeah. So when it comes to research findings, um, this is going to be a slightly debatable part, but this is what, um, again, this is our practice, mm. it's debatable, but yeah, we can figure it out. Um, so when it comes to research findings, there are two types of research findings. The first type of research findings will be observation methods, which are very clear, methods. they are very concrete, they are backed by a lot of evidence. So for example, um, I'm going to jump back. In this case, um, all the blue stuff, uh, all the blue uh, text in this row, you can form a concrete pattern based on all of this, uh, all of these findings. But there's another kind of uh, finding from research, which is called insight. Uh, the naming may differ from people, from, from <coughs> team to team, people to people, and there's a lot of argue, uh, and debate, uh, argument and debate about it. But what, who are we without in the debate? Um, so insight is more of a leap of intuition based on the qualitative findings that you have. So I'm going to give examples of what is an observation pattern and what is a research insight. So an observation pattern, okay, let's say you have an e-commerce shop and you want to figure out like what communication channels you should be uh, starting out so that uh, your customers can reach you uh, on your e-commerce shop. So maybe you have like call, um, you have messaging, you have emails, um, you have chat. Okay, so you have four different channels that you're considering and you want to do some research on your customers to figure out like which channels do customers actually prefer to reach you by. So you go out and do some qualitative uh, research and maybe the pattern that you find is that, oh, all of your different users, all of your maybe eight, 16, I don't care how many, all of your um, interviewees, they all have different preferences. So they are equally, they equally prefer, maybe two of them prefer phone calls, two of them prefer um, emails, two of them prefer uh, chat, and two of them prefer, um, what the last one, social messaging, if I'm not wrong. So the finding, the, find, the, the pattern from here is that, oh, uh, there are no clear preferences for users on the, on the communication channel, that one. 
So where does that lead us to? That observation pattern may lead you down the path of like, oh, actually, all of your communication channels are really important, and I should be starting all of them out. Okay, so that's the pattern layer. It's what you can easily observe, forming into a pattern itself. So when insight comes in is when you draw into uh, the findings across all of your interviews, and you go in a lot deeper into like, why do you prefer this channel? Why do you use this channel? Why do you use this channel the most? Do you use this channel equally for all of the e-commerce, the other e-commerce shops that you, uh, that you go to? And the insight, which may take a leap of intuition or a leap of judgment, whatsoever you call it, may be that actually people don't really care. Again, people don't really care about the channel that they use, but they care about whether or not they're able to reach you in a timely manner. And that insight is very, very, it's going to lead you down a very different path in that it will tell you, actually, you just need to staff one channel, but you make sure that one channel is staffed really, really well, and people can reach you immediately in their own time, in their own convenience. So patterns can, patterns and insights, one of it, the insight can be a little unreliable because you are making uh, a judgment call based on your own intuition, your own prior, prior knowledge. And it's a lot up to the researcher or whoever doing the, the interpretation to figure out what exactly is the insight and what exactly is the next thing to do. But insight is where we often find a lot of unexpected um, next things to do. And so these are the two different uh, types of findings that we have from the research, qualitative research. So moving on. To yeah. So um, we're talking a bit about qualitative insights, and then when we talk about quantitative insights, I think it's extremely important for you as researcher to measure um, using quantitative data. Probably most example, easiest example probably is like GA. Um, I believe is that if you don't measure it, if you don't re if you don't achieve a baseline, you can't really improve it because having a baseline and then when you can compare it with the current one that you have, you know where you should improve and then whether you, what you're doing or what you've done previously is right or wrong. So um, when it comes to when it comes to metrics, um, typically metrics should be three. Uh, sorry, there is three signs of good metrics. Um, first one is understandable. Understandable not only by you, by researchers, but also understandable um, by the stakeholders as well. Um, and then ratio or rate. Um, ratio or rate so that you can see the growth of it. So whether it's 70%, 50%, um, and then compared to the previous one. And it's supposed to be comparable as well so that you can compare it with your previous iteration, for example. And then, so as I mentioned to you before, usually we would have like a dashboard. Um, we would have it in a TV. Um, this is obviously fake numbers. Um, Shun has remade it, but this is something that you can easily build it using um, what is it? Using uh, Data Studio. <laughs> so using Data Studio, you can just integrate it using GA or Firebase, and then you can have it. You can turn it on on TV and then everywhere um, in the team that you want people to see the numbers. So um, you see the structure of our um, finding spreadsheet for qualitative. This is typically our structure for quantitative. So um, usually we would look at it by the time period. Um, ideally, I think it should be by sprint, so, so that you know that this particular sprint, whether the design is working or not, whether your research is working or not. And then um, you would look into the customer, uh, we would look into the customer journey. So customer journey for our case is like, for example, um, whether they, what is it, sign up, and then after they sign up, whether they monitor the utilities, and then like whether they make payment, um, and then like whether they refer to other users, and so on. So we will look into our customer journey of the product. Um, we will look into product and features that, um, what is it, product and feature, the, probably some particular features that we have. Um, we will look into releases as well, so that we can monitor for releases, um, which releases is working on, so that we can measure for it. Um, exact releases and then we will look into campaigns as well because um, most likely if you're in a big company you will have like a marketing team who does the, the campaigns the marketing campaigns and then like you sometimes like there, there are a lot of times because like it's quite siloed and then like hey how come the numbers are quite spiked and then apparently because there's a Facebook page that is um, that is talking about something else about our app for example so yeah so this is an example obviously fake numbers again um, this is an example of our um, our own dashboard, not the dashboard, not the data studio dashboard. This is our own team dashboard where the designers and researchers would look into the numbers. 
So we would log into the monthly, um, and then we would log into, the, uh, for example, for customer journey, we would look into awareness, engagement, and then payment. We would log into each particular screens, and then on the bottom of this, usually there would be like campaigns and releases, and then some research efforts as well, so that you can measure, for example, you you did a research particularly over here, and then the 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 recommendation is built on that particular month, and then you can see the next month whether the numbers are improving or not. So clearly something went wrong in April. Yes. <laughs> yes. Fake numbers. Yeah. So you have your insight from your poll research. You have your insight from your con uh, research. Now what? Uh, now it's time to share it out, and because we only have around ten minutes left, I'm going to speak through the rest of this section really quickly. So, um, when it comes to crafting good insight, um, there are three principles. I'm, gonna, I'm overusing the word guidelines here, but um, generally we will keep them informative. Uh, you would want them to be uh, rich. Uh, you want them to be inspiring as well. And informative of like, what is the next action that uh, it can inspire? What, what's the next action that you might be do, doing? You also would want to try to make your um, insight memorable so that people can recall it easily. And people are not going to be like looking at your report all the time while figuring out the product development decisions. So you better make them memorable so that people can have them at the back of their minds and it's like part of their unknown conscious. So, yeah, story. Yeah, so some tips on crafting um, the report. Generally, we try to make sure that our data is comprehensive. So we talked a lot about our note taking. Um, our, for qualitative and quantitative, our data is very, very comprehensive. This helps to keep us honest and it helps to keep our insights believable so that we can easily find to say like, this insight is backed by this uh, data. It's, uh, you can go, go back and look into it as well. Uh, the second tip is that let intuition guide you, which is what we just talked about. Sometimes you, you need to make leaps of intuition to find that brilliant nugget that will help you do something great. Uh, so, Spending a lot of effort into uh, having very comprehensive data um, ensures that we are not so we are less biased uh, in our insight generation as well. We also try to do insight generation with a team to uh, catch any missing perspectives and again to keep ourselves honest and make sure that we're not like being too sweet by the loudest voice in the room. We try to get feedback from peers. We maybe present. Uh, we, will, we maybe like craft a quick uh, report and we uh, present this to someone that we trust so that we can get feedback quickly. Does it make sense? Is there anything that's missing? Um, we try to tell specific stories, like I noticed that everybody listened to Nanning talking about the EV drivers who brought their pillows to the cast. So we try to tell stories like this. And also, <coughs> I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing the name correctly. The first workshop today talked a lot about storytelling, so I'm, I believe there's a lot of good tips there that we can use. Um, we try to tell very specific stories to make it very engaging. And then we add quotes and pictures as well to again increase the engagement factor, make people understand and believe that these are real people that we're talking about. Uh, these are the real quotes. There's all the grammar errors, Singlish, any single language that they are speaking in, all in there. So this is an example of our report, um, and this is the actual report that we put. So the only thing that we changed is the illustration because initially it was a picture of the. Um, the users. Uh, we always trying to make, we always trying to put pictures of the users, and then we always trying to ask um, consent first from the user whether they're okay with that we put the the pictures of them into the report. But typically, this is a structure of our report for discovery insights. Um, these are the main insights. Um, so we trying to make it short and memorable as well, and we is more of a, like a pointer or the most important thing about the conversation but obviously when I present it to the stakeholders I would go deep dive into each of it but I wouldn't put all the insights for each of it um, on the slides so I'll put into the most important things and then I will put all the quotes um, into the into over here so that the user w the, the audience can read the quotes and then see the, the quotes over here is um, the quotes that are supporting the insights over here um, so that's why we can see, so for example, like I would go through this and then I would tell, yeah, as you can see as well from the user and the quote number two, um, he's saying about yada yada yada. So um, this is usually the structure for discovery insights. And then typically when we test the designs, one of the most important thing when we um, show the report is when what the audience typically want to see the most is that the recommendation. So as a researcher, it's extremely important that you're not only telling the insights, but also to um, 
tell to give a clear recommendation as a researcher my recommendation is to do design a b c d e for example or um, the design should be changed to into this 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 and you don't have to show all of the insights that you have i think it's also your job as a researcher to get to understand what your stakeholders is looking for and then show only what your stakeholders is looking for and what you think is, a, is the most important as a researcher. So that's why we always put like the before and then the after as well. And then we always highlight why this one is not working, why this one is not working. So the right one is a recommendation that we're going on. That we, we go on with because of the reasons of based on the interview. Yes, so I think this is the end. Yeah, so okay, maybe I'll, we'll jump to the recap. <coughs> And then uh, we'll start uh, fielding questions. So we have two from the post it. Yep. So a quick recap on what's happened today for today's workshop. Um, so we did an introduction to user experience, user um, experience research. We did planning. Um, uh, we covered like what we do to plan a user interview. We covered um, the the general like rules of thumbs and guidelines around user interviews. And then we also talked about how we generated insights and report findings. Um, and let's keep it Yes, okay. Um, in the meantime, while we're asking questions, if you have some time, please fill in the feedback. So yes, please. First time please. doing this workshop. <laughs> yes. Talk and so feedback will be very useful for us for future yes. workshop. And, but in the meantime, okay, for now, we are going to start answering some questions. So I think yep. we'll Okay, thank you. Okay. So first one is, how do you get your exact user segment by recruiting agency um, active user or accept? So I think one of the things that we, um, I put it in the handout as a note, but I didn't, uh, I think we didn't really mention it in the slides, is that when you approach a recruitment agency, you should know exactly um, what you are targeting. So it's not like you work with the recruitment agency trying to figure out who are the target user. You should be aligned with your stakeholders on your the users that you want to target, and then you go to recruitment agency, know exactly, okay, I want a user from, for example, 40, 50 years old, using our app, um, have this at home, have this smart home device at home, blah, 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 blah. So when you approach a recruitment agency, you should know exactly who the people that you want to target. I think it's not really about doing it with the recruit agency. Hopefully this makes sense. Um, how you ensure high turn up rate for user interview. So um, it, maybe it doesn't really happen for uh, B2B, but for us, Contrib, it happens a lot. Um, for example, when we recruit seven, typically when it's raining on probably um, the user never really, uh, what is it, reply our emails, most likely they would bail out. So it happens a lot. Um, so usually that's why we always use meeting invitation. And then when the user doesn't accept our meeting invitation, we always um, try to chase them. So we will send email to them again. You haven't accepted the meeting invitation. Do you know about this? Um, what is it about this interview? Or do you want to take it or not? Um, those one of the things that we do. Another thing that we do is that we always try to buffer the users that we recruit. So for example, we try to recruit seven. We usually try to recruit a scheduled nine. Um, and then like we probably, if it's, if all of them turned up, then it's good. We get more users. Um, but then like if, um, probably two doesn't turn out, we still get seven. So yeah. Any other questions? Ah, wait, the, you, this one first, I think. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, can you give a practical example of how you qualify interviewees in a screener? Huh? In a screener. Can you give a practical example on how you quantify, qualify? Okay, so I actually put, uh, okay, the question, can you give an, a practical example on how you qualify interviews in the screener? So I actually put an example of screening in the handout. Um, I forgot which page, but um, on the recruitment section, we put like a example of our type form. Um, so typically we will send a screening form using type form and then we will blast the type form into our pool. Um, we know exactly what, so usually we would put stuff like, um, uh, we have some screening data in our pool already. So for example, whether they use our app, um, where they live, not exact address, but probably like uh, area. Um, and then like whether they have um, smart home device. So for screening questions, it's always differ for every research rounds. But um, that's why the screening questions always um, different for every research, as in like because the targeted users are always different for every research round. So usually, 
um, it is something that is aligned between you and the PO. For me, as in it, between me and the PO, is something that is aligned. For example, I I want to go for our SP utilities app users. I want to go for non app users. I want to go someone who pay using gyro. I want to go for someone who use internet banking, for example. So we have a very specific um, target, um, and then we will put it into type form the questions, um, and then the question will be yes or no, and then like we will see. Um, the submission, and then we will handpick the user uh, based on the submission. So yeah, you want us? Oh, really? Oh, okay. So, how do you conduct uh, user research with non-local users? Um, uh, so, I haven't conducted user research with non-local users here, but I have done so with uh, in my past experiences <laughs> and through listening and talking to friends. So, for me, um, a lot of my interviews in the past were actually conducted through video calls. So you lose a lot of um, the body language there, but a lot of the users that I had to interview, they were based in the US, or they were based in Australia, or they were based in Europe. And for me, it's way too expensive to find me around so often. So very often, I just had to make do with um, yeah, video, video calls and, and, and we figure our way from there. Sometimes uh, we do do, I, I did used to do like some overseas trips where like we try to if you do do it overseas trip, you will try to pack that trip as much as possible with all the interviews and all the customer visits that I can do. So I've always been doing B2B, so we will try to pack as many like office visits or customer visits as possible. Uh, we have some notes about remote research. So I previously, in my previous work, I do a lot more. Actually, most of the stuff that I do is remote research as well. So a lot of it is through video call. Uh, we put some notes as well in the handout about remote research if you want to learn more about remote research. I forgot page, which page, but yeah, we put some notes about B2B research and specifically about remote research as well. But there's another question about what's your thought um, about set, settling, getting. sending to, getting. getting, oh, getting, sorry, getting to observers in a session. Okay, um, this happens. So, okay, the reason we do cast because we don't want to have more than two people in the room. Um, initially, for example, the EV one, um, they are, I, I'm very thankful I, have a, I had a very good stakeholders where they are extremely interested with, with the user, that um, the main stakeholder um, told the whole team, which is, consists of 20 people, that is mandatory for them to go to the interview, which is impossible for me as a researcher to allow that many people to interview one particular person, right? So that's why what we did is that we cast the whole session using Skype and then they book a meeting room in our office. Um, so we, we did an interview somewhere else, um, in their, somewhere near their charging station. So it's a very fresh experience after they charge and then they talk to us. And then we cast the whole session to our meeting room. But in our consent form, we already said that the whole session will be recorded and it will be casted. So they should have known already that um, everything is casted. But um, when they go through talking to us, they don't feel like it's watched by the whole people. So again, it goes back to when you are with a stranger and they are asking you questions like how many people do you want watching you answer the question it can feel really stressful so again it goes back to all the trust and comfort and rapport so that's why we are pretty strict about like how many people will let into the room yeah. so there's another question about can user interviews be done by sending online forms for example google forms instead of face-to-face -face interviews um if it's a form i would say there will be a survey um because in a form you can't really ask follow-up questions you can't ask like why is it like that how is it like that while the gist of the user interview is more focused on the how and the why and you wouldn't be able to get the how and the why from form um, and then sometimes in a form you can't really make sure that the answers that you're looking for Eh, the answers that they give is, is the right the answers that you're actually looking for so you can't really control it but if it's a one-on-one -on -one session i think you can really control like oh what i'm asking is this or what i'm asking is that and you would lose a lot of expression so i'm not saying that you can't really using google form but maybe you want you might want to rethink about your methodology maybe if you can't really do use interview whether you can do survey or not maybe something that you should consider Okay, survey, survey is a different methodology for you to find different forms of data. Maybe you want to blast, out, blast it out to more people, and that's when you would use a survey. But with the, the beauty of a user interview is that it's very rich in data and very, very in-depth. And let's be honest here, who would spend more than 20 minutes filling out a survey? It's yes. true. Yes. So, yeah, so it's a very different method of research, and it generates very different data for you. Okay, time, I think. So, I think the time, we have exceeded the time a little bit. So thank you so much for your time today. You've been an excellent audience. If you have any more questions. Thank you. Thank you.